Hello and welcome to... Goodness, that's too loud. Hello and welcome to uh, a live broadcast from Planes TV back in the studio. Um, and I'm here with a degree of trepidation because I've had a hardware failure this morning on my uh, Vision Mixer, um, which is going to make things extremely complicated for me. Uh, but welcome and... Uh, wish me luck is all I will say um, I've put together some highlights from as you tell by the title um, the, the Duxford May Air Show which is where we should be this morning I've put my t-shirt on uh, in honor of the fact um, and you'll see I had a busy morning with the little ones who provided me oh no I've just realized I've forgotten Bo's artwork that's a shame let's put Ike, Ike's up again oh that is such a shame Bo thank you very much for your coloring in on the uh, F86 so, I'm very grateful. Morning, Guna. Good to have you. Dear, oh dear. Now you'll see, you may see there's a strange stro sort of strobe effect on my fingers. You may not. Um, but it's one of the issues I'm having this morning. Also issues with audio routing. It's a bit of a shame. This is, Kit's been working brilliant for about eight weeks. Switched it on at nine o'clock this morning. And it's come up with an error, which normally I would do a uh, sort of factory reset on it. But of course, we're we're live today, so I don't have the time to do it. But all being well, uh, we do have some really nice little bits and pieces from um, from Duxford over the years. Oh, you, you're going to have to scream at me in the chat if audio is looking dodgy because my uh, monitoring system isn't isn't quite what it was up to uh, 24 hours ago, sadly. Um, which is when I was recording a couple of interviews with um with Ben Donnell, airshow commentator at Duxford, and also uh Peter Archer of the Duxford Aviation Society. Um both of whom gave up a decent portion of their time and I'm really grateful to them. Hopefully add a bit of value to uh the broadcast today. So I thought I'd start at the sort of beginning. Um maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but um Planes TV or a company started by my dad in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, of course been covering Ducksford shows since that time period. Um, and I've dug out a bit of archive material from the mid 90s. This is Ducksford year 1995. Um, and this is, uh, uh, yeah, the, the little section on there from uh, the May show. Uh, it's a quarter of an hour long. It's a lovely sort of historic retrospective of um, how Duxford looked in those days and it's also 14 mi minutes long which means it'll give me a chance to sort out some of these technical gremlins hopefully but I uh, hope you enjoy that and we'll be back in a little while with some more recent uh, show highlights. Duxford display year runs from May right through till October and in May we have a VE Day air show commemorating the 50th anniversary of VE Day. Running through then to June we have a Midsummer Air Day which is just an, uh, an opportunity uh, to see some of Duxford's historic warbirds, albeit privately owned for the most part, uh, performing here at Duxford. Since 1961 when the airfield actually closed as a Royal Air Force station, uh, Duxford, uh, after a few years of sort of being under care and maintenance, uh, became an outstation of the Imperial War Museum in London. And initially it was kept uh, for storage of large aircraft exhibits that London obviously couldn't house, and then it became a museum in its own right. Of course, part of the Imperial War Museum, uh, but nevertheless a main outstation uh, of the museum. And housed here at Duxford in its uh, listed buildings, its World War I hangars, uh, we have the most amazing collection of aircraft, military aircraft, running back to 1916 and going right on through to aircraft that actually served in the Gulf War. We start then at Duxford's V Day show on May the 8th, and the rare sight of both of Boscombe Downs Harvards. One of these aircraft led a cavalcade of historical types over the capital. Here's a glimpse of a few that departed from Duxford. 
Certainly in London, it's got less clouds, so the sun's already uh, broken through, the sun will burn it off. Uh, and so the whole of the city was uh, bathed in sunshine. So that should be good. Virtually everything on display at Duxford owes some of its ancestry to this important pioneer. The Blairier was, of course, the first aircraft to cross the English Channel. This one is a replica owned and flown by Michael Carlson. The Tiger Club performs an entertaining routine of streamer cutting, flower bombing, and limbo dancing with the little home-built turbulent aircraft. They're powered by a Volkswagen Beetle engine and can proudly boast that the Duke of Edinburgh once flew the type. Despite its vintage appearance, the Antonov II is actually a post-war design and still in production in China. Parachute dropping is just one of its many roles. It's one of the world's most successful aircraft used in over 40 countries as a military transport, crop sprayer and duster, ambulance, battlefield reconnaissance, airliner, met research, and it's even been used as a jet engine test bed. The jumpers today are from the Pegasus parachute team. If any warplane epitomizes Duxford, it's this one, the Bristol Blenheim. Firstly, it was a revolutionary design, faster than the fighters of its day when it went into service, and made an important contribution in the early stages of the war. Secondly, very few still exist anywhere in the world, so it would be a prized exhibit for any museum. But thirdly, this one flies, and the preservation effort expended to put it into the air would probably have been impossible at any other UK facility. We'll be seeing more of the Blenheim later. Plain Sailing's Catalina is a Duxford-based favourite and actively supported by the Catalina Society. Flying in RAF markings, it is a reminder of the crucial role which aircraft played in defeating the U-boat in the North Atlantic. Its success... Good morning, everybody. If you're just joining us, welcome. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in to this uh, replay of some of the highlights of Duxford May air shows over the years. And we've stretched back into the archive here to 1995. Um, an interesting year, and it was interesting seeing the Blenheim, Blenheim there in its previous configuration. And we will be seeing more of the Blenheim later on, and uh, including a little interview with uh, John Romain as well in the year that it returned to uh, the skies in... Hmm. I can't remember what year it would have been. Someone could tell me in the chat. Um, but yeah, there's that to look forward to. And we'll also dig into highlights from, well, we'll go um, in a minute to 2011. And uh, we'll actually uh, have a chat with Ben Donnell. He uh, kindly spent some time with me yesterday picking out some highlights from uh, 
Duxfords over the years. Uh, so it'll be 2011, right through the uh, the teens. Um, and it would have been right up to the current day, sort of the 1819 shows. But as I said in the intro, I had a technical snag this morning with this uh, with my setup here. So apologies if there's any quirks during the stream, um, but hopefully we'll uh, pull something off here. I'm just stalling a bit, a bit, a little bit, because there's a really nice shot coming up in a moment. Forgive me for talking over Spitfires and Hurricanes. Beautiful stuff. It's this shot here with the B-52 outside, and it's a familiar sight to me, that. That's where we spend... round about there is where we're positioned. Um, let me think about this. It'll be further airside now. Um, but that's the sort of site that we're used to uh, recording from uh, during in the current day, sort of 2014, 20, 15, 16, so on. But of course there's no B-52 B there anymore. We have the um, British Airliner collection from the Duxford Aviation Society, and we'll be talking to chairman of that society later on, Peter Archer. Um, but in the meantime, let's enjoy this material from 1995. I'll turn up the Lancaster. In photo reconnaissance and later flight refueling and airframe test work. The military Auster flight provides an effective demonstration of a little recognized aircraft role, that of Army cooperation. The Auster first appeared during the war and served valuably through several versions for artillery spotting and communication until superseded by the helicopter. An imaginative pairing of two World War II fighters. The physical difference is striking, yet both did the same job and achieved similar success in their respective theatres. The Spitfire's slim line stem from its inline Merlin engine, whereas the Hellcat's big radial and requisite strength for carrier operations demand a big, sturdy airframe. What these two aircraft share, though, is active frontline service, and both are credited with kills. The Spitfire in operations over the D-Day beaches, and the Hellcat in the hands of US Navy ace Alex Vraku. Both are owned and operated by the Duxford-based fighter collection. Another Navy warbird and another contrast to the Hellcat. It's hard to imagine a slow, lumbering biplane being an operational success, but the exploits of the swordfish are legendary, and it served right through World War II. This is one of the two flown by the now privatized Royal Navy Historic Flight and it appears in the authentic markings it wore operating off the Mack ship SS Rapana. The 
The World War II German Storch had the same job as the Auster. It is operated by the Duxford-based Aircraft Restoration Company. German aircraft in flying condition are rare, and strictly speaking, this is a French example built by Moran with a radial engine, but it still exhibits the original slow handling characteristics so important for its army cooperation role. This is the only original World War II German combat aircraft flying anywhere. And, until today, the only ME-109 on display with an original Daimler-Benz engine. It's taking off to welcome a new resident to Duxford. ME 109 G10, owned by Hans Dietz and recently rebuilt in Germany from an amalgamation of airframes. Gorgeous stuff that with the ME109's superb sounds as people are saying in the chat. Um, yes, some aircraft we don't see anymore, obviously Black 6 and uh, the likes. But uh, hopefully you enjoyed that little dip back to 25 years ago to 1995 Duxford season. That was the May show uh, highlights if you like. And they went into a programme called Duxford Year 1995. It's available on DVD and Blu-ray. I'm, I'm going to see if I can try and get that up on the... PCV on demand service this week. Um, speaking of which, the the next little bit of video that we'll watch and uh, Ben Donnell will introduce um, is uh, from British Air Shows 2011, and that has just gone live on watch.planestv.com. So if you enjoy what you're watching here and would like to see more, um, do go take a look at watch.planestv.com. At the moment, there's a free trial available. Um, and uh, yeah, that uh, sort of helps support what we're doing here, which is obviously a free to view, uh, enjoyable morning watching uh, through some of the highlights from the May show at Duxford. Um, as I said at the beginning, technical snags this morning, so I'm running on backup systems, so wish me luck. Uh, and during the flap I had setting up that backup system this morning, I lost my poor daughter's beautiful colouring in, which is going to provide a nice backdrop for us all day today. And I thought I'd set, I have no idea whether this will be of interest to anyone, but I'm doing these uh, Saturday broadcasts each week. Um, and if you would like to uh, have your artwork featured behind me, do feel free to send me a picture on uh, Twitter. I'm Ian Plains TV on Twitter, or you can find the Plains TV one, V1 on there. Child colouring in would be wonderful. Uh, thank you to, gosh, where did I get this picture? Uh, Strike Eagle 492 on Twitter. Thank you very much. This is from one of his photographs, I believe. Um, yeah. Bo, my daughter's been doing a bit of freestyling on top of it, but you get the gist. Sorry, I. You're trumping yours. So, yes, if you've got a piece of artwork you'd like to see featured up uh, behind me, uh, do uh, send me a picture on Twitter and uh, I'll try and include that in a future stream. Okay, let's take a look. So uh, let's go to the recording I did yesterday with uh, Ben Donnell, who kindly spent about an hour with me going through some of our sort of highlights of uh, Duxford May air shows over the years. So uh, yeah, I'll let Ben introduce himself. Ben, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's going to be an interesting 
morning, afternoon this, uh, looking through some of the highlights of the Duxford May Air Show. Um, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, your role at the show and how you first got involved with Duxford, perhaps? Well, thank you very much, Ian. Pleasure to uh, to be here. Yeah, I'm Ben Donnell, the uh, commentator for the IWM Air Shows at Duxford. And as to how I first got involved, well, Duxford was somewhere I've been going since childhood. It's the venue I've been to probably more often than anywhere else. Coming from East Anglia, it was uh, one that was relatively local to us. And in 2009, when I started doing air show commentary, um, Duxford was one of the places I approached. The first one I did was React that, uh, that year. And then they had someone, I seem to remember, who became unavailable to do the October show in 2009. And they asked me if I would step in quite late on. I did that show and I've been doing the IWM shows ever since. Fantastic. And it, it's interesting that I have, I've never spoken to you about that time period before, but that ties in with when we started doing the show as well, which was, a, yeah. I believe is 2011, based on the files I've managed to find on the various hard drives. Um, and it's the first little, little program that we'll show here. If I can cue that up, this is... Um, it's actually an excerpt from British Air Shows 2011, and it's yeah. the little segment from uh, from the May show that year. So the theme here, and this is one of the things about the May Air Shows. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's just listen to you introducing this. There he is. Struggle over dropping audio 2011, levels. the Spring Air Show. It's been Ladies' Day at Duxford today, the theme Women in Aviation, celebrating 100 years since Hilda Hewlett became the first British lady to gain her pilot's licence. So yes, it's uh, always been an opportunity to, to build themes and build a flying display yes. around that. Not always an easy thing to do, a limited selection, but a, a nice theme to have in 2011. Yeah, even if, as we saw at the very start of that clip there with the windsock, quite a lot of the <laughs> aircraft flown by women that day weren't actually able to get airborne. It was horrifically gusty, as it yes. is actually on the day that we're recording this. It um, is. And this is, yeah. And it, uh, you were saying before we started recording, I'm, had the display been going on this weekend, but that would have been a challenge this year as well, but... It certainly wouldn't would have been, yeah. And we saw Tizzy Hodson there with the Slingsby Firefly, and that's Polly Vasher with is. her Piper Dakota, in which she flew around the world. Um, the intention was to have a whole section of the program devoted to uh, uh, aircraft flown by women, and then the others dotted through the show. But uh, as it was, I think only three of the ones intended to go up in that sort of more coordinated slot were able to do so. But nonetheless. It was still a very enjoyable, very interesting day. Absolutely. And the the themes, obviously we have quite often the VE Day air shows, the sort of on the five-year anniversaries of VE Day, and of course D-Day as well. I've dug out a D-Day 1995 programme that has a bit of Duxford on there to show later. Um, uh, th that must take some work to, to produce that in the build-up to the show. Oh yes, and we'll talk a bit more about that later on with some of mm. the themed events to come in this uh, in this feature. Um, it's something that, of course, isn't so much a part of the May show now, because very often in the past the May show would be almost devoted to a particular theme. Mm. Since 2017, with the new format of the Duxford Air Festival, the idea is to put on a more a show with more general wide appeal but still it's possible to bring themes into that with some of the individual uh, display slots as we've seen at those events as well mm -hmm. yeah and this i remember this show it was a a nice eclectic mix but as i say early days for us at duxford as well so this would have been a it might have been a two camera shoot would have been, but we'd have been testing the water shall we say on what the <laughs> commercial yeah. viability yeah. of it was and but there's some nice material here. I'm quite. I've really enjoyed going back to that that year in particular. Actually, is this finale? Now this was a very nice display. Yes, this yes. was the uh, uh, the then two lady display pilots of Spitfires, Carolyn Grace with the family owned uh, T9, and Anna Walker with the Kennet Aviation Seafire, which she'd started flying the previous year and they put on a really really sporty display towards the end Superb. of the day by which time the wind had dropped away a little yeah lift the audio a bit Thank you. 
sporting some very distinctive markings following its participation in the air show for the 50th anniversary NATO Tiger Meet was Golden Apple's F-86A Sabre. And here it comes, the Sabre. Further late additions to the programme were two more of the Duxford-based fighters, the historic aircraft collection providing its Hurricane and historic flying the Hispano Bouchon. Here they come from the right this time, ladies and gentlemen. The historic aircraft collections, Hurricane 12 and historic flyings, HA-1112 Bouchon. So that was uh, a couple of clips from uh, 2011. Some really nice material in uh, obviously beautiful weather. It's amazing the number of May shows where we have had that uh, sort of warm blue, you know, nice contrast in the sky with a bit of clouds um, going through the material. We've been really lucky over the years uh, uh, to have had uh, lots of uh, May shows like that. Uh, that also includes, let's find the right one. Um, Excuse me. <laughs> it also includes uh, the Duxford 2012 show. So this was uh, themed. This was the Jubilee Air Show. So cast your minds back to the wonderful time of 2012. Uh, <laughs> sort of in the current context, with looking back to uh, a wonderful year of Olympics, Diamond Jubilee. It's uh, yeah. Nice to look back on. So I'm going to play the introduction to that programme. Uh, introduced by Ben again and gives you a sense of uh, the occasion and then we'll go through a couple of the highlights. Beautiful weather, some fantastic flying and a popular theme made Duxford's Jubilee Air Show the perfect start to the IWM's display season. This four-ship of historic aircraft, the Dragon Rapide, Anson and two chipmunks, represented machines with royal connections. Another highlight giving his first ever public display, the new Belgian air component F-16 display pilot, Commandant Grat Tiss. And a first-time British mainland appearance was made by the French Air Force Cartouche Doré aerobatic team of Epsilons. Duxford has rarely looked better than it did on this sunny May afternoon and we very much hope for more of the same later in their 2012 season. And that was, uh, as I say, the introduction to 2012. And I've just picked out a couple of highlights. This is from our edited programme rather than the sort of full length uh, flying displays. If you're used to watching these broadcasts on a Saturday morning, I've tended to play back long sections of our live mix. We weren't doing that back in 2012. Um, but it, uh, you know, these shorter edits, this is just a couple of minutes long, uh, gives you a sense of the flying displays. And this one, this flying display, a real favourite of mine. This is the Matadors. New colours too for the Matadors, back with Red Bull sponsorship on their two Extreme Air XA41s. Stunning formation and individual aerobatic work from Steve Jones and Paul Bonhomme. The creator was a man named Philip Steinbach, a German designer who used to work for the Extra Company, also famed for its aerobatic machines before he decided to embark on his own projects. He 
Well, the prototype Extreme 3000 over just four and a half months. Not long afterwards, Steinbach took first place in the German National Unlimited Aerobatic Championship in 2006. It was his first unlimited level contest and the aircraft's first competition appearance. The aircraft is now built by Extreme Air at Magdeburg with Steinbach as the head of design. started displaying together in 1994 initially as the Sukhoi duo with a pair of Su-26s. Later they became known as the Matadors and gained sponsorship from Red Bull. Just gorgeous stuff, isn't it? That backdrop providing uh, an excellent backdrop, want of a better word, to uh, things like the heart and uh, yeah, not a team we've seen in a good in a few years now, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, I'd love to see them back on the circuit. Fingers crossed, eh? So the theme in 2012, as I say, was the Jubilee Air Show, and uh, this next display features four aircraft with a royal uh, association, and uh, Ben will talk through that. Uh, this was commentary recorded uh, on the day and it's interesting to hear how that commentary was recorded I don't know if you noticed on that last piece but uh, it sounds like we had a microphone sat by a speaker that seems to be the uh, way we were doing things back then I think Ben and I will talk about that uh, again in a minute but so this is a four ship of Anson, Rapide and two chipmunks. Mark Miller leading in the Dragon Rapide with John Corley in the Classic Aircraft Trust's Anson joined by a pair of chipmunks. The bright red example from the Henlow Chipmunk Group is that on which Prince Charles learned to fly at nearby Bassingbourne at the end of the 1960s. <laughs> Over the motorway comes the Royal Forship, the de Havilland Dragon Rapide, the two de Havilland Canada Chipmunk T10s and the Avro Anson T21. All of these aircraft with royal connections, whether in terms of flying training or the transport of members of the royal family. perhaps a little more tenuous than that of the repeat because the type was used by number 24 squadron royal air force which undertook vip transport during the war this was in anson one form and during that time number 24 squadron did transport members of the royal family on occasion so it is possible that a member of the royal family may during that time have flown in an anson the chipmunk is very popular on the civilian market nowadays after its retirement from military service and the aircraft restoration company here has rebuilt several. They're still popular as tailwheel trainers for organisations operating heavier historic aircraft. Out in front of us performing cell aerobatics is a chipmunk with a very special history in it, that which sees it participating today. It's serial, it's WP903. It was built in 1952 and from 1960 to 64 and again from 1968 to 1970 it was assigned to the Queen's flight. It taught the Duke of Kent, Prince Michael of Kent and Prince William of Gloucester to fly during its first period with the Queen's flight and then Prince Charles in the second. And when you get a chance to look at the aircraft when it's back on the ground you'll notice that quite apart from the day glow red livery it's fitted with a warning lamp called the Parrot of the cockpit combing. This was attached specifically for its royal use.
Superb seeing the chipmunk dancing around those skies. Clear blue. It doesn't get any better, does it? I'm looking out the window now. It's certainly very sunny. I know the forecast was for high winds in the sort of Duxford area. So what we'd have been seeing it on the on the show site today, I don't know, but uh, we can only imagine. And hopefully these videos are helping you do that, do exactly that. And um, we'll go back to a uh, the chat we had with uh, Ben yesterday now, and we moved from 2012 to um, highlights from the 2013 show, I believe. Cross our fingers. Let's see what we've got. And so on to 2013 uh, then, and the the May Air show. We had the Eagle Squadron. We did. This was a special tribute to the fact that 2013 was the 70th anniversary of the American presence at Duxford during the war, starting with the moving in of the 78th Fighter Group, then with P-47 Thunderbolts, and Duxford becoming, having been prior to that, obviously an RAF fighter station, then Station 357 of the US Army Air Forces. And so in conjunction with that brilliant aviation photographer John Dibbs and some of the operators and pilots, this tribute was put on called the Eagle Squadron to reflect the origins of the American involvement with fighter operations in the European theater in World War II through the American Eagle Squadrons, and indeed prior to that with the involvement of Americans on an individual basis in the Battle of Britain. And what transpired was one of the most memorable things I have ever seen at Duxford. This was how it started mm -hmm. with a missing man formation. We had the Biggin Hill Heritage Hangar, Hurricane 10, and one of Comanche fighters, Spitfire 1As, in fact, the only one they had flying at that stage, both in the colors of American aviators or Eagle Squadron in the case of the Spitfire, number 71 squadron, the P-47G Thunderbolt of the fighter collection, and over specially from the States, the Razorback P-51C Mustang of Comanche fighters. Superb. And that backdrop as well, blessed with good weather, it makes all the difference, doesn't it, when you've got a beautiful sunny sky, a bit of contrast in the... It was gorgeous, and they'd flown in equally beautiful conditions the previous evening, their rehearsal, which I remember watching with members of the Flying Control Committee from the top of the control tower. And it's one of my favourite moments from Duxford. Mm. This gorgeous combination of fighters, gorgeous combination of very different engine sounds. Yes. And flown by four absolute masters. Paul Bonham in the lead in the Hurricane, then we had Dan Friedkin in the Mark 1A Spitfire, Ed Shipley in the Mustang, and Steve Hinton in the Thunderbolt. And that was the head-on break into two pairs, after which they went through paired formation aerobatics. Fantastic. And in the... Was it just the one day we had the formation flight with the Red Arrows? I think it probably must have been. It sounds... Feels it like was a one-day of... co this, so um, uh, yeah, so that they they did do it towards the end. That uh, run in by the Thunderbolt and the Mustang, with that amazing sound the Thunderbolt makes when it's really wound up, mm. was absolutely tremendous. And this was the first time, I believe, since the war that the Razorback high back fuselage P forty seven and P fifty one had flown together wow. over the UK. Wow, that's quite something. An interesting size difference there. It's incredible seeing them. Oh, side. huge. And of yeah. course, we then have the formation finale of their initial slot with that great Duxford favourite, the B-17 Flying Fortress, Sally B, with Peter Kuypers at the helm in the lead. Superb sight. Let's listen to that. Is a high point not just of this Duxford show but of the whole air show season. The four Eagle Squadron fighters, the Hurricane, Spitfire, Thunderbolt, and Mustang, accompanying the Royal Air Force aerobatic team, the Red Arrows, in salute to the close links between British and American airmen. 
Now this is the sort of thing that takes an awful lot of planning. It's not not very many people get to fly with the red arrows in this kind of way. It must have been a uh, quite an undertaking. It certainly was, especially since the Reds had been at a show, I think, in France mm. on the previous day. This Duxfordshire, as I say, taking place only on the Sunday of the weekend. They flew into Cambridge during the show. They then obviously had to brief with Paul Bonham, the formation leader. But with all of that done, they were able to fly together, having first formed up near Bury St Edmunds for their run-in while various other displays were taking place. And that was the penultimate act of the display before the Reds obviously went through their own sequence. Yes, which we're, which I'm saving till the last on this, uh, this Saturday broadcast. I thought I'd, uh, yeah, well, you've got to have a Red Arrows to finish a flying display, haven't yeah, you? If you cool. can choose. So, yeah, so stick around, everyone, for that later this afternoon. We'll uh, pick uh, the best Red Arrows display that we've seen at a Ducks of May show over the years. So moving on now to, um, what year was this? This would have been 2014. And this yes. was a... This was your request to include, and quite right too. Um, let me drop the audio a little bit so we can uh, talk about the. Uh, it would have been a D-Day uh, anniversary year. Let me think about this. Seventy-five it was, years. Seventieth. Seventieth. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And we had two uh, two Dakotas over from uh, the United States. We did. We had Whiskey Seven from the National Warplane Museum at Geneseo in New York. And we had uh, an aircraft that is now known as Placid Lassie. In fact, it wasn't so named at the time. Operated by the Tunison Foundation in Oxford, Connecticut. They both flew over for the D-Day commemorations. And this was, again, one of the great Duxford moments. A formation display by the C-47s combined with a parachute drop by the Red Devils. That's Whiskey 7, the National Warplane Museum aircraft taxiing out. This display was an interesting one. It took two slightly different forms over the weekend because obviously you always, in planning a special salute such as this, with pilots who haven't necessarily flown together before, got to consider the um, formation competence and experience mm. of each pilots involved. The other three aircraft, all flown by people very, very seasoned on the British display circuit, and here they are in a formation takeoff. Just looking at my uh, folder of notes here, we had uh, John Dodd and Ben Cox in the Tunison Foundation aeroplane. Pete Kinsey and Andrew Dixon were leading in the Aces High aircraft. And it was the two Dutchmen, Peter Kuipers and Chris Hosina, in the Dakota Heritage aircraft, as it was then, Dragonoot which is now owned by Aero Legends. This was the very spirited takeoff by Whiskey 7. And what we can hear coming in there is the commentator for the Red Devils who were on board one of the aircraft who uh, carried out a yes. parachute drop quite fittingly for a D-Day commemorative air show. Here yes, we these were with modern sport parachutes mm. um, rather than D-Day style round ones, but it was still a very, very evocative sight to see them jumping from, in this case, the uh, Tunison Foundation aeroplane, one of the two transatlantic visitors. Glorious afternoon by that point as well. Mm. Oh, look at that. This was nice. a beautifully coordinated sequence. Yeah, it's, the, it's uh, so, sort of sequence that Duxford is uh, so well suited for, but well equipped for, you know, the... the con the uh, consistency of shows, you know, the people that are involved, you, it really does require that to carry out something like this with uh, seeming ease. <laughs> can put it like Absolutely. That. And uh, this, of course, with the inclusion of the parachutists in the slot, rather different from the sort of scenarios that are often put on at Duxford. This was one mm. of two special sequences that almost bookended the show. Um, because we also earlier on had a mass display of gliders on tow and powered motor gliders to represent the D-Day gliders, which was also very imaginative and uh, effective. Quite right. And here we see coming down hey, virtually that... amidst the... Uh, I've just spotted myself. <laughs> I've just spotted myself. <laughs> yes. I was stood next yeah. to the wing of the wildcat, I think. <laughs> and therefore had a very, very close view of that descent. Yes. You know, what, uh, what they did was um, obviously get the, um, the three ship airborne, including the parachutists, first. Mm. Get Whiskey Seven airborne to a closer hold, 
and then we had a, a solo from Whiskey Seven to fill in the time. And I believe we have a little int- uh, little interview with uh, some of the crew of Whiskey Seven who who clearly found this a very very emotional experience, bringing an aircraft involved in D Day back to the yeah. UK and the, to the area of the country that uh, it would have uh, flown from. I was rather hoping I could have, uh, oh yeah, the very spirited. Us from uh, the United States was perfect for us. It was better than we could have anticipated. We had wonderful weather. We had very favorable winds and uh, everything about the airplane and the crew, I couldn't ask for more. Yeah, superb stuff. Very glossy looking airplane. It was, yes. This was its first stop of its visit to Europe. It, of course, then went over to Normandy for some of the commemorations that took place there, flying largely during those official commemorations with US Air Force C-130 Hercules for Mm -hmm. commemorative parachute drops. And then it cleared. We had a three-ship display from the other three C-47s, and then, as we can see here, Whiskey 7 gradually nosed into the formation. That, I think, is the view from Dragamoot, Chris Hosina and Peter Kuypers at the controls. Chris, I think, nearest to us there. Yes, and then we can see Whiskey 7 closing up to the back of the three-ship formation. The most touching moment to me was yesterday as we were flying from Presswick down here to Duxford, we came down across the East Midlands. In 1944, on June the 5th, Whiskey 7 departed RAF Cottesmore at 11.15 at night with the 17 paratroopers headed for uh, St. Mary Glace. Yesterday, after flying uh, over Barkston Heath and and them clearing the pattern for us to, to return to the original Army Air Force bases that they served out of was was incredible. And when we approached Cottesmore, which is closed right now, it's an Army barracks, and flew down that 8,000 foot runway at maybe 50 feet above the ground, slow and low, I just felt like Whiskey 7 had really come back home, where she started the, the greatest moment of her history. Ben, this has been a fantastic weekend. I think you'll agree. It certainly has, and uh, well, what luck we've had with the weather we had almost. Yeah, I think we were using the uh, uh, comment- live commentary there to bring the program to a close. Uh, it's uh, it's interesting for me going back over these recordings to see how our production style has developed at Duxford. Obviously, it's, oh. you have the benefit of two shows a year generally. Uh, oh, actually, three, maybe three with the October in the very early days, and uh, yeah, gradually bringing in the the PA in a live fashion making a recording of it um it sounds in this yeah. year as though we, we had a microphone sat near a speaker and that was our <laughs> public address feed <laughs> yeah uh, that could uh, could sometimes uh, be the case and as we'll reflect on later on it developed even further with the uh, use of the big screens in some seasons to uh, come but there's a couple of seven yeah, at the, at the end of its slot on uh, Sunday. And this was and this is one of the things you really only see at Duxford with the configuration of the airfield. It's superb. And, and that vantage point down the end of the grass runway there. Yeah. Um, it, we can't quite use, can't quite go as far out as that anymore, but uh, providing yeah. some pretty interesting vantage points that, uh, yeah, the public that's don't the get to when That's the Saturday there when um, uh, all three landed back because on Sunday... The Asus High aircraft went off slot in that Got beautiful it. run and break pass that we saw. So on to 2015 now, the VE Day anniversary air show and the salute formation. Um, yes, now this was a multifaceted tribute. 2015, 70th anniversary of uh, VE Day. And it was also that year marking the 70th anniversary of B-17 Flying Fortress Sally B operated by Ellie Salingbow, and it was also 40 years since Sally B arrived in the UK, initially at Biggin Hill, but then soon moving to Duxford 
1975 and of course it's been on the circuit ever since and the idea was to put on a special formation of Sally B with a number of warbirds all American types in fact but uh, including some in British markings to both pay tribute to the end of World War II in Europe and to Sally B herself by rekindling something of the sort of formations that used to be put on at the Great Warbird Air Displays at West Morling and Rawton um, that were held in aid of the B-17's operation. So we had B-17, B-40F, Wildcat and three P-51s and then Catalina, C-47 and Beach 18 in two elements. And a beautiful formation it was to bring to a close on the Saturday and earlier in the programme on Sunday really provide a high point of what was an especially memorable and especially imaginative show absolutely this is an interesting example of um uh some of the operational considerations that can take uh, uh that can enter into the equation incidentally because you'll see the weather was quite different when they did the two slots over the <laughs> two days it had to be earlier on the program on sunday because several of the warbird fighters involved had commitments at Oostvold in the Netherlands that they needed to um, depart for. So it took an early slot on Sunday. In the end, the weather prevented them from actually departing. So they could have done it at the end, but of course you can't rejig a complete program. Take that into account at such short notice, but um, course, yeah. The events that led up yeah, and it's perhaps a mark of um, how well thought of Ellie is in the community. Ellie Salimbo, run, uh, oh, runner of the B-17, that so many aircraft found it found the time and the uh, willing to put in the effort to uh, pr provide aircraft for this display it's quite a sight that with a number of oh, fighters and in the b17 biggest formation with fighters that the b17 had flown in for some time and of course you need to choose types that can fly with it comfortably mm. in terms of their performance and uh, ability to uh, fly at the relatively slow speed of the b17 so for example the corsair couldn't take part in this formation, but it was perfectly possible with the Mustangs, the Merlin engine P-40, and for the Wildcat as well. Uh, this was a very interesting show, it's worth um, pointing out, because in 2015 and 16, there was a bit of a new concept for the uh, IWM shows at uh, Duxford, in that both the May and September shows were to be themed. Obviously, mm. Duxford has always, as we've seen already, had very, very strongly themed shows. But the idea came forth for beginning in 2015 to put together a much more structured type of flying program. And so it wasn't just Second World War aircraft. The idea for this VE Day show was to trace how military aviation developed prior to the Second World War, then take that story through the Second World War up to what we've already seen with the salute formation to represent types that were in service in 1945 at the end of the war, both in Europe and the Pacific. So we started off with some World War I aircraft, took it through developments both on the civilian and military sides between the wars, and then, then that led into the D-Day story. And it was put together by a working group that I was part of, along with people from the IWM on the uh, historical, the uh, media, the commercial side and so forth. And of course, absolutely key, the flying display director, who then was Jeanne Fraser, yes. who was to have been one of the women who flew in the uh, Women in Aviation show in 2011, but uh, couldn't do so on that occasion because of the weather in her Piper Cub. But she was, as the team uh, that succeeded her are, so so skilled at putting together these um mixed formations and uh, all of what we see in this feature up to the end of the 2016 season was in a large part down to jan yes and very resourceful in, in bringing together flying displays oh, that that link in totally. with those themes and not not a totally. not an easy task i'm sure no and uh, as i was saying you've got to make sure that everybody has the correct formation qualifications if you're going to do these things correct tail chase qualifications are also required and um, yeah, it worked superbly well with this um, the e day show from a commentary point of view um, with a very heavily themed event like that you've got to do all the more in the way of preparation than you would ordinarily because the idea was that we would create an entire commentary narrative including music 
archive interviews, of which the IWM has a lot in its archive, obviously, and so forth, and weave it all together into hopefully a coherent show. And that was particularly the case on the Saturday of that weekend when it all was more or less in chronological order with a few um, modern aircraft and aerobatic items inserted um, into the mix as well. And it worked really well. I think it's a, a brilliant way of presenting what can in some cases be quite familiar aircraft in a new way. Mm, mm, absolutely. And it, you know, it may be familiar aircraft. It may be aircraft that uh, the cachet that Duxford has brought in from very far afield, but sometimes you just get lucky being on the on the doorstep of very many um, aircraft restorers. And uh, yeah. going on to our next aircraft, which was um, yes, a, a, a site not seen for many years, and you'll have a better memory than me of exactly when the Blenheim last flew. Would have been gosh. Prior to this, it was 20, uh, 2003 okay. when it suffered a landing mishap at Duxford, but then it looked rather different. It was a long nose Mark IV, but this was the debut of the aircraft post-restoration in May 2015. It had taken to the air for the first time in this short nose Mark I night fighter configuration at the end of 2014, and this was the first chance we had to see it taking part in a public display, and what a display it was. Superb with the two Spitfires. Yeah. I think we even get to... um, In a a moment, sorry, Ben, talking over you, in a moment we'll get a a brief chat with with John Romain, actually, which he kindly carried out on the day with yourself. Slightly unfortunate camera angle uh, for for poor John, but we'll, uh, we'll cut to the live action now and watch this through, and you can see this is a segment, actually, from the edited program from 2015 debut of the newly restored Blenheim 1F, a really big weekend for you. Yeah, it is, and uh, it's very special to have it here. Um, obviously, it's based here, but actually to see it display its first public display is, uh, is a great privilege, actually, for us as well as the public. The effort that's gone in to restore the aircraft and bring it to this Mark I configuration really has been considerable. Oh, it has. I mean, it's been uh, 11 years since uh, we saw the the long nose version out here, and uh, 11 years and 26,000 man hours. So it's it's taken a lot of time and money to put it here. What are some of the main differences between the Mark I and the Mark IV as it was from a pilot's perspective? Uh, Cockpit ergonomics are completely different. All the controls are in different places, uh, so we're having to get used to that. It's faster, it's about 10 mile an hour faster in the cruise. Engine handling, about the same as before. Uh, A little bit of ground rush, there's a lot of glass in the (laughs) nose on this one. And you can see it between your feet, especially on landing. So we're tending to suffer a little bit from ground rush on the landing. But we're getting used to it. Uh, Lee Proudfoot has now flown it as well. In fact, he did his first display practice yesterday. Uh, But it's it's running very well. Three aircraft that typify Britain's struggle against the odds in the early days of World War II. The Bristol Blenheim, an aircraft that when Lord Rothermere ordered the Bristol 142 as a one-off executive transport was quicker than equivalent monoplane fighters, but which was sadly outmoded when the Blenheim, which had attracted the interest of the Air Ministry and entered service as an RAF bomber in October 1936 went to war. (laughs) 
resurrected to fly by the aircraft restoration company following a landing incident at Duxford in its previous life, as it were, as a Blenheim 4. It was originally built by Fairchild in Canada as a Bolingbroke, the Canadian's name for the type. It made its maiden flight, having been reconfigured with a short nose as a Blenheim 1F in November last year in the hands of John Romain, with also onboard engineer James Gilmore. And once again, it becomes the sole airworthy Blenheim or Bolingbroke in the world. The two Spitfire 1s that flew with it in an outstanding formation, also redolent of that early war period. The one that landed first, N3200, served in period with number 19 squadron at Duxford until it was shot down and made a wheels up landing on the beach near Saint Gat in France 75 years ago tomorrow, the 25th of May 1940. It first flew last year also in the hands of John Romain, the second of the two Mark 1As, P9374, another veteran of the Battle of France, and the evacuation of Dunkirk 75 years ago this week. That aircraft was downed 75 years ago today, the 24th of May 1940, in the hands of pilot officer Peter Casanova, who made a forced landing on another French beach just north of Calais. Some superb highlights there from 2015 and my thanks again to Ben for joining me yesterday to pre-record these uh, little segments looking back on those those air shows and there'll be more to come in just a minute. We'll move on to uh, 2016 but I just wanted to interrupt briefly to say a big thank you to everyone for joining us. Hope you're enjoying the uh, the stream and um, planning lots more of these throughout the summer and um, they are uh, they are fun to do. They are a bit of a commitment and um, but we're um, indebted to people like Ben and uh, later we'll be talking to Duxford Aviation Society's chairman Peter um, for uh, to talk about his organisation as well and we're indebted to those people to uh, yeah who's happy to spend a bit of time with us and hopefully provide a bit of entertainment for you during this odd period we're going through. Um, if you're feeling generous uh, this uh, air show weekend uh, obviously it would have been an air show weekend for us we'd have been at Duxford hopefully selling lots of DVDs and Blu-rays um, in order to try and shift a few, I've set up a sale on the website. So if you fancy watching a bit more of this action from Duxford shows uh, that we've covered, all the DVDs and Blu-rays on the PlainsTV.com website are currently 30% off. That's my little plug. Um, so do check out PlainsTV.com if you uh, fancy a DVD and Blu-ray or Blu-ray to watch in this, uh, as I say, strange period. Um, you can, of course, also watch the majority of these highlights on watch.planestv.com. That's our on-demand service. And we opened up the um, the uh, stream today with a... Well, actually, we opened with a bit of 1995, which isn't, isn't on the service yet, but uh, British Air Shows 2011 went live a day or two ago, and it's superb to look back on uh, just nine years ago, the sorts of air shows that we were enjoying. And in my email newsletter I sent out on... Friday I was reflecting on just how many shows we were covering back in 2011 and I vowed in that email to uh, when we're all back to normal and air shows are a thing I'll certainly be trying to do my very best to cover more of them in the future not take them for granted and um, so what else was I going to say oh yes just a quick thank you to those uh, joining in the chat and um, if you are watching and haven't said hello in the chat please do friendly bunch in there and it's fun to uh, yeah, have a chat with like-minded aviation enthusiasts uh, over there. We're live on YouTube and Facebook, and there's chat on both. Um, quick uh, hello to Guna again. Thank you for your support, Guna. You kindly uh, uh, chatting with my my dad who's over there in the chat. Started the business a long while ago. Um, and also to oh Shirley, bless you. Just sent some stars over on Facebook. Thank you very much. And who else was it? Kevin over there sent some stars as well. Kevin Platt. Thank you very much, guys. So enough rambling from me. Enough plugs and thank yous. Let's go back to the flying action. And we go back to, this was four years ago in 2016. Ben and I reflecting on some of the highlights of that show. So on to 2016 now and a really interesting pairing of the Bronco and the Skyvan. Let's drop that now. audio a little bit. Um, this, uh, both aircraft associated with Tony De Bruyne who's uh, a wonderful member of the airshow community. I know I get on very well and uh, yeah, it doesn't, I don't think I operate the Skyvan anymore, but certainly the Bronco. 
Yes. Now, this was a show that was called the American Air Show. Ah, uh, yes. And it was to celebrate the uh, reopening of the newly redeveloped American Air Museum at Duxford with all sorts of uh, new displays. And if you haven't been in it, you really should. It's a fantastic, fantastic museum building that really does set a high standard. And again, the idea was interesting scenarios around an American theme. And for part of the Vietnam scenario, the idea was here that the Bronco would be showing something of what Broncos actually did in Vietnam, operating as um, port air control and ground attack aircraft and escort aircraft in their own right. And here, the Sky Van, not a type involved in Vietnam, but playing the part of the American transports that were, the likes of the C-123 providers and so forth. And so the Bronco initially escorting it. And this was yeah. a one-off display that they put on especially for this show with many, many practices in the weeks prior at Duxford. Which clearly showed as well. It's a very refined display, with complete with, I, I, I believe, a formation touch-and-go uh, midway through. My memory is a little hazy, and we're probably about to find out whether I'm correct or not. But yes, yeah, some, some real innovation in that. Nice onboard. Now, this was the, the first of the shows where we had... Um, the big screens, which we ah, had for a couple it? of years at uh, Duxford. And again, this was coordinating the action in the air with the commentary. And so I put together a narrative for, again, the entire show, very strongly historically based, and also to some extent based around the sort of exhibitions you can see in the permanent ground displays at Duxford. And all coordinated with live footage from the displays on the big screens, but also with archive footage and archive audio that were played over those yeah. screens. It really was something very challenging and very, very interesting to be part of. It was, and I feel I feel like we'll re revisit that kind of scenario in the future as technology yeah. allows audience members to maybe enjoy that material, not just on big screens, which it's a bit, big screens are a bit of a weird thing at air shows because you, you don't want to position them airside where they block the view of aircraft. So you, they yeah. end up at, at, in strange locations where actually you're probably not looking at them during the flying display unless you're yeah. wandering around and not very engaged with, uh, with the flying. Mm -hmm. But I can see scenarios in the future where um, certainly people like yourselves looking, w watching this at home, enjoying a flying display could really, we could, I think, produce something quite engaging uh, uh, in the way that we were doing it in those Duxford shows. Yeah, and obviously Duxford, with all the IWM historical material at their disposal, was an obvious place to be uh, um, uh, be experimenting with this, and uh, I, I thought it was an excellent innovation. What we saw there was the Sky Van doing a, a tactical Kaysan style um, approach, simulating a troop or equipment drop-off with the Bronco waiting in the background, and then Tony was able to show us a bit of what the Bronco can do solo. They were used to help direct fire from naval vessels. They dropped paratroops. This truly was a jack of all trades in Vietnam. And one US Air Force Bronco pilot, Captain Steve Bennett, typifies the heroism that was on display. He won the Congressional Medal of Honor for his sacrifice in Vietnam. He was on a fire control mission involving US Navy ships when he was diverted to help some US troops who were under attack by North Vietnamese infantry. His aircraft was hit by an SA-7 surface-to-air missile and was ditched. That was a hazardous operation in an OV-10 with its high wing. His Marine Corps forward air controller managed to get out, but Bennett lost his life. In total, 81 Broncos were lost in Vietnam, mainly US Air Force aircraft. A Schwartz aircraft derived from the Skyvan, the Model 330, was procured by the US Air Force and used as an uh, intra-theatre transport within Europe as the C-23 Sherpa. But here they come, in for a formation landing, Skyvan and Bronco.
Sticking with 2016 then, and onto a, well, a five ship uh, display involving the Zero and, yeah. of course, uh, a couple of Hawks and the, yeah. gosh, what are we missing? The Wildcat in the well, end there. Yes, this was to represent the Pacific War. So we had the um, Harvard mocked up to look like a Zero, which came over from Aero Retro at uh, saint rambert d'Albon in France. It was flown by a pilot very well known at... Uh, Duxford, Patrice Marchasson, and the idea was it was to be set upon by four fighter types that at different points were active in the Pacific War against Mitsubishi Zeros, as this Harvard has been mocked up to depict. There were no pyrotechnics being used at Duxford shows at uh, at this time, um, hence the uh, airfield attack sequence being entirely simulated by the uh, Zero, but it was nonetheless quite an interesting aeroplane to have over to fill a gap because there's no similar aircraft currently on the British display circuit. Yeah, quite right. And I'm, I'm wondering who... Uh, okay, we can see a couple of aircraft on the runway there, so they're probably about to, to scramble, I suppose. Just... Uh, they were, yes. Yeah. The Zero sort of flew around on its own for a little bit, and then the Fighters scrambled, I seem to remember, in two pairs underneath, all of them from the fighter collection. One of the main operators, of course, at Duxford, as most people watching this will need uh, no reminding of. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do then is uh, watch through this display in its entirety. It's a good quarter of an hour or so of display. Here they are scrambling. War was officially declared on the 8th of December 1941, and from there the US never looked back. Here go the Curtis Hawk 75 and the Grumman Wildcat into the air to join the defending fighters. There we've seen the Corsair and the P-40C amongst the defending fighters running in to try and fend off the attentions of the Zero. Mitsubishi chief designer Jiro Horikoshi did a dramatically effective job in conceiving the A6M. He used light aluminium alloy, which was also developed in Japan. But the light weight of the aircraft and its long range came at a cost. The A6M was vulnerable to enemy fire and adding adequate protection negated its advantages. It was the pilots that in many ways made the difference. The men of the Imperial Japanese Navy were hugely skilled at managing the aircraft engine and at long range navigation in the expanses of the Pacific theater. Perhaps the most famous Zero Ace was Sub-Lieutenant Saburo Sakai, who scored 28 official victories. During August 1942's Battle of Guadalcanal, the first big Allied offensive in the Pacific, Sakai flew his damaged Zero 640 miles in four and three quarter hours back to the aircraft's land base at Rabaul, with a blinded right eye and heavy bleeding from a head wound and partial paralysis after he was hit by fire from US Navy Douglas Dauntless dive bombers. It was one of many heroic feats performed by Zero pilots during the Pacific War. The Allies started to turn the tide in 1942 with the battles of the Coral Sea and Midway. They scored important successes in destroying 
Japanese carriers, four of them at Midway alone, and attrition became a problem for the Japanese. The inexperienced Zero pilots, who increasingly were left, were no match for their US and Allied counterparts, and they took advantage of the Zero's weaknesses. Here we have the Hawk 75 and the Wildcat, now in pursuit of the Japanese fighter. Early in the Pacific War, the Wildcat was outclassed by the Zero, but with tactical improvements, the American pilots of the Grumman F4Fs and FM2s began to win the day. Allied pilots would use an element of surprise and advantages in heightened speed to negate the A6M Zero's rate of climb and its turning ability. The Curtis Hawk 75 we see here in the air with the Zero representing the P-36 which saw its sole action of the whole of World War II in US hands at Pearl Harbor. A number of them were based at that Hawaiian station and they managed to down two of the Zeros that formed part of the attacking force of the 7th of December 1941. If you're watching, wondering what's about to happen next, so am I. So this is a segment from our live mix of the show. Um, let's just turn Ben down, the live commentary. Um, I'm going to very unprofessionally just scoot forward. That chap can walk superbly fast across the runway, taxiway. The zero is coming in. And then what I'm looking forward to, I believe... Let's just hear what Ben's got to say of the Pacific War, with the exception perhaps of the P-36, which saw limited use. And now about to run in these four fighters from the Duxford-based fighter collection in salute to the Pacific War. Here we go. This is what I was looking forward to. It's a nice segment here of the four fighters on their own or in the, in the four ship. Where we start to worry about technical <laughs> technical glitches catching up with itself let's hear the sound of these wonderful aeroplanes
in the lead here, the Goodyear FG1D Corsair. Goodyear also built the Vought F4U, the distinctive bent-winged bird, as it was known, on account of its inverted gull-wing configuration. Used throughout the latter stages of the Pacific campaigns by the US Navy, the US Marine Corps, and Britain's fleet air arm, Royal New Zealand Air Force, another important exponent of the Corsair. And in use as a fighter and fighter bomber, they supported amphibious landings by Allied forces, including at the crucial battles of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. The glorious silver aeroplane in this formation is the Curtis P-40C Tomahawk, part of the great line of Curtis P-40 variants that were produced during World War II. A stable, docile aircraft, a stable gun platform, and very durable, which it had to be in some of the theatres in which it excelled not just the Pacific, but also the deserts and the snow-covered fields of the Soviet Union. P-40Cs, like this aircraft, were delivered to pursuit groups of the then US Army Air Corps early in 1939-1940 period. And units at Wheeler Field and Bellows Field in Hawaii flew P-40Cs at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack, but just 25 of them survived the Japanese strike. Final pass here from the four aircraft from the fighter collection, concluding our Pacific War salute. tubby little machine with the black and white invasion stripes following the Corsair on the brake, the Grumman FM2 Wildcat. An aircraft first employed in anger by the fleet air arm of the Royal Navy, who initially dubbed it the Marklet. It was a favourite aeroplane, this, of the late great Captain Eric Brown. And at the start of the Pacific War, it was the prime US Navy fighter, although only one carrier-borne unit was fully equipped with Wildcats as of the Pearl Harbor attack. And FM2 versions built by General Motors, like the one we see here from the fighter collection, continued the aircraft's success later in the war as the Americans advanced through the Pacific. It was now a much more effective fighting machine than it had been early in hostilities flying from the small deck escort carriers to provide fighter escort and close air support. This is the sole airworthy Wildcat currently flying in the UK. Its markings those of a fleet air arm aeroplane, as indeed are those of the Corsair that was leading the quartet. In the case of the Corsair, the markings of 1850 Squadron Royal Navy in late 1945, serving aboard HMS Vengeance in the Pacific. The Hawk 75 of the fighter collection, an outstanding combat veteran, an outstanding survivor. It served during the Battle of France with the French Air Force, the Armée de l'Air. Then when France fell later in 1940, it joined the Axis side, this Hawk 75, 
forming part of the Armée de l'Air de l'Armistice, as the Air Force of Vichy France was known. And it was engaged, this airframe, in engagements around North Africa against British aircraft, like Ferry Fulmars of the Fleet Air Arm and Hudson's, Sunderland's and Wellington's of the Royal Air Force. And the P-40C, which will be the last of the aircraft to land, one of the Fighter Collection's most recent additions. Stephen Gray, the founder and boss of the Fighter Collection, a great enthusiast of the Curtis fighters. And this one appears in the gorgeous natural metal scheme of a station hack for senior officers based at Chinook Field in Kansas. We had Alan Wade in the Corsair. Brian Smith was flying the Hawk 75. Talking of the fighter collection, don't forget, their Flying Legends air show is again bound to be one of the highlights of this display season, taking place here at IWM Duxford on the 9th and 10th of July. Make sure you book your advance tickets now. Yeah, it's worth reminding everyone that that's a recording of their 20, gosh, where are we? 2016 show. So sadly, Legends not taking part this year, as we all know, but we are hoping, <clears throat> excuse me, we are hoping that we may return to Duxford in September. Um, and we'll talk briefly about that in a moment. Um, I hope you're enjoying these landings. I thought I'd let this run through the uh, the full live mix of this, uh, the end of this display here. Uh, it's something I find quite pleasurable about watching aeroplanes land, especially these uh, tailwheel warbirds, a challenging aircraft to deal with, uh, no doubt. Um, and yeah, it's quite uh, quite nice to see them being treated so uh, so. Uh, Carefully, fantastic stuff. And I've just been looking at the weather forecast as well. I've just changed my thing to uh, knots here to see what the. It's interesting seeing the windsock there, sort of fairly down the runway there. Um, the forecast at the moment, so live. If, if Duxford was going on uh, today, looking at gusts of uh, 30 knots, west south westerly wind, may have been tricky, may have been fine. Um, a quick thank you again to all those people leaving stars over on Facebook. Uh, it really does help uh, justify these things. Uh, who was it? It was Sarah and Anthony sending 200 stars. Thank you very much. Every little bit helps. And some lovely comments over on YouTube again. Um, gosh, who was it? Andy saying thanks in and Plains TV for what seems to be coming a weekly air show. And that's certainly my intention. 11 a.m. every Saturday um, is to bring you a, a live show of some sort. Um, looking back at uh, yeah air shows that we've seen in the past in in lieu of any air shows this year, um, and he says it's excellent and thank you so much for keeping up as aviation geeks entertained. Well, it's entertaining for me too, Andy Baird over on YouTube, and someone else saying absolutely agree with the above comments. Thank you Ian, for doing these weekly shows. Really enjoy them. Well done on getting Ben in for a chat as well. Well, that's thanks to Ben really. I didn't. I made the request and bless him, he made the the time for us. Um, someone else who made the time for us and someone else who's would have been uh, looking forward to generating a bit of income this weekend at the Duxford May Air Show it's Peter Archer of the Duxford Aviation Society we'll be speaking we'll be watching back a conversation I had with him yesterday in just one moment but I thought I'd just do a quick um, plug of our own product so this is uh, let me think about how I can do this um, 
dear, dear. I, I said at the start of this stream I'm running on a couple of backup systems and I am. Um, so this is our website, planestv.com. As I said earlier, some of the, in fact, all of our Duxford DVDs and Blu-rays are discounted at the moment. So you'll see there, even last year's Legends and the September show. In fact, that September show one has also the Mayor show and the Ducks o Dax Over Duxford um, show. Just a small segment on that. All of them 30% off. Um, on the home page there's uh, the more recent shows and if you fancy something really back in the archives we've got look at that flying legends 96 on sale along with classic jet and fighter air show 96 and the program that we showed at the very beginning ducks video 95 if you do fancy one of those um, dvds blu-rays they're all available at planestv.com helps us keep the wheels turning over here at planes tv hq and um, so over to uh, a conversation I had with Peter Archer of the Duxford Aviation Society. They look after, in fact, own the uh, airliners that we see out the front there at Duxford, providing such a wonderful backdrop for our cameras. Um, let's hear from, uh, as I say, this conversation I had with Peter yesterday. Well, uh, yeah, the Duxford Aviation Society has been going nearly 45 years now, a charity based at, uh, at Duxford, a partner of the Imperial War Museum, who are our our landlord we've got a good relationship with them and we think we've got the best collection of british airliners that you're going to find anywhere ranging from the 1940s uh, avro york that took part in the berlin airlift right through to the 90s the supersonic era uh bac 111 uh, trident a dc-10 and our most recent addition of course is a, a britain norman trilander that flew in about uh, three years ago so a good collection of airliners charity uh, I chair it at the moment. Um, my turn to sit in that seat. Mm -hmm. But we have three or four hundred volunteers who work for us on various things. It's quite a big organisation. And we are thinking through how we're going to reopen. We're working on that quite a bit at the moment. So, mm -hmm. you know, lots going on, Ian. Yes, and a, and a wonderful collection of historic aircraft, but a, 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 an, an historic society in itself, running since 1975. Yeah. Um, Tell us a little bit about the the very beginning of the society. How did it start? Um, well, the, the Duxford Airfield was sort of abandoned. And then um, the East Anglian Aviation Society set up a little branch there. And then they they, graduated. they actually used to run the airfield. IWM hadn't arrived at that time. They ran the fire service and other bits and pieces. And gradually they started building the collection of airliners. A few flew in. Um, a lot of them, or several of them, came in by road in bits and pieces. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. a crew would go out to Liverpool or wherever, uh, disassemble a Viscount, and then it got trucked down to Duxford and over a period of a quite a long period, rebuilt. And uh, yeah, our airliners now, um, not only are they a sort of exclusive collection, but they are also in immaculate condition inside and out. And, and that's one of the things the visitors like to see, the inside of a, a retro airliner. Yes. And it also is a line of business for us. Uh, in, in non-COVID-19 times, mm. hiring out to film companies who want a set uh, mm -hmm. piece, uh, a period airliner. Why build one in a studio when you can go in a real thing and uh, and film whatever it is there? So that that historically has been quite a big bit of our business. But we're suffering because of COVID-19, uh, like many businesses. Um, we rely mainly on people coming on site, um, looking at our airliners at air shows, but you know, charge a bit for that. Going to our bookshop on site, uh, good business, but... It needs a footfall, and we don't have the footfall at the moment. No, it's sad. And with IWM, we're working our way up to working our way up to uh, coming back into business. The plans are Good. quite well advanced. Good, and of course, we're talking on uh, you know the May air show weekend, or what would have been, and uh, we're of course both yeah. reliant on the sort of uh, footfall that that would have generated the the, the revenues. Um, but what? Um, what other ways does uh, in this scenario? Okay, we're we're really hoping we might get an air show in September, aren't we? But uh, in this scenario, how can people support you? How can people follow what okay. you do and um, and in, engage with some of the aircraft? I know I've been playing with the okay. the Concorde app. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, like you, we're we're hoping that the Battle of Britain air show, the 80th anniversary one, would take place on the um, uh, September the was it 19th? I think that weekend. Good question. Three, this can be actually over. Th it's going to be over three days, I, um, and uh, what the plan is, is uh, spreading it out a bit. They're going to have to impose quite a lot of restrictions on how many people can enjoy the event, so tickets might be a bit hard to come by, but it, it could mm. be quite a good event. So we're looking to that, but 
we won't be able to make the sort of money we make normally at an air show because we rely on quite large numbers of people going through our airliners and we're going to have to develop more bespoke products for that you know um, sell it in advance or book it on the day spend half an hour on the flight deck with somebody standing back a distance talking you through how you would set the vc10 up for takeoff or how you would set concord up for, for whatever yes um, and that you asked how we're earning money you mentioned our concord app mm -hmm. um if you go via our uh, facebook page which is uh bridairliners.org i'm um, sorry our website bridairliners.org you will um, find a link to a concord 360 app and you can really explore our concord very well um from that app 99p i know but yeah, you know, we need the money at the moment. You know, we're, like like you were saying, revenues are dropping everywhere. We're a charity. We don't have a a, a big stash of money to spend. Um, we need we need people to support us. Uh, yes. So we have the Concord 360 app that we're selling. But also, if you go to our Facebook page, um, and I think there was a post about the 12th of May, what we've got on there is a free 360 tour of the Concord. Uh, sorry, the Comet flight deck. Right. So you can have a look around the Comet flight deck for for free. And we're aiming to do a few more of those over the coming weeks. Um, we have access to the site, although the site is pretty much locked down. Um, mm. With special arrangements, we can go in and film and maintain. So this is the airfield itself, off. which is just, just the locked down. Itself, mm. yeah, I mean, the airfield is closed to the oh, the museum is closed to the public at the moment. Um, a few people are on site. They haven't really started fully with the volunteers and that. And I think the, the aim is they're going to try and open to the public probably early August time. But then with people, the volunteers and staff coming back in bigger numbers before that to start getting ready over the, the preceding month. Yes. Our, our people are pretty teed up for that. A lot of work involved in risk assessments and all the government guidelines that have to be followed. But we're getting uh, we're getting there. But meantime, we're trying to put up more of these 360 degree cockpit or flight yes. deck views of our airliners. And next week, we're hoping to put together a short video of um, the Concord nose lowering. Now, I know people have seen that quite a few times, but we were going to. What we're planning to do is like start to finish how how the nose is powered nowadays, the hydraulics, how it works in the cockpit, the pre pre flight checks, um, how it operates, and then you know that links in with how it works outside as well. So we think it's going to be quite an interesting little video that we'll have ready in a, a week or two for a free view. But, yes, I was saying earlier. So um, I was chatting to your. Uh, marketing uh, marketing chap Charles and uh, he, he spoke about the live broadcast you did last year end of March celebrating gosh I can't remember the anniversary exactly of Concord's it, it, it first was the, uh, it was the yeah uh, last March was the 50th anniversary of the first Concord flight yes and so there was a, a live stream broadcast from um, the Duxford Concord our one but also yeah. involving the Manchester Concord and the Brooklands one and what we tried to do was um, coordinated simultaneous nose groups um, and, and it worked quite well. We had a, a bit of a glitch um, with, with one of them, but it, it worked mm -hmm. quite well um, and, and it got a huge, um, huge audience. And, well, I think I mean, it deserves a month. bigger audience as well. Forgive me for speaking <laughs> over you, but I, I, I lost a good half hour watching the, uh, the the talk that was given alongside the nose droop and, you know, the stages oh, of excellent. flight. It's really good yeah. and engaging content. And that's on your, your Facebook page, which we should tell people is... Uh, no, it's the British Airline Collection on Facebook, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, well, that's it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, um, but you're a, a more refined um, version of the same coming out soon. You hope? Well, yeah. What we thought of a bit behind the scenes on a on a nose droop, how it works, um, talking about how it's powered hydraulically, switched electrically, showing you the pre-flight check in the cockpit, and then showing you the actual operation in the cockpit, and meshing that in with what's happening outside but yeah it'll, it'll be something to pass the time where we're all locked down and uh, people well, to look that, at that's the aim of all of this isn't it and it's why we're, yeah. we're, we're doing these saturday streams you know looking back on our um favorite bits of uh, of the air shows that we've seen in the past and if i put you on the spot then so of all the cool. the may shows you've been to in recent years give us a give us a highlight or or two that you've uh, enjoyed witnessing of the air shows that that's of the, the yes well I mean, I could talk about our bits, but of the, I mean, clearly, I, I like the noisy jets. So, um, you know, when, when you see the uh, the uh, jets come in and uh, Red yes. Arrows, of course, have to say that, don't know, you'll see probably in behind me, I'm a bit of a Red Arrows fan. Yes. So um, uh, that, that's always good. And, and we like what the highlight of that is they often when they're arrive, you know, like they like to arrive and surprise everybody. They use the um, the tail of our VC-10 as a point to enter the airfield because it's very visible to them. So if you know what's going to happen, 
whilst all the crowd is facing the runway, you actually look over the buildings, over the BC ten tail, and you can uh, can see them coming. So we've got some good video and photographs of the the arrows over our BC ten. Um, yeah, that's probably the highlight for me. Fantastic, and and me as well. They're a wonderful team to uh, try and record on video, and uh, perhaps we'll end this broadcast with the. Uh, as is fitting isn't it to finish any air show a nice red arrows display and with a bit of luck we'll pr yeah. probably have a few shots of your airliners which will always make for such a wonderful sort of wide angle shot from our filming location they're uh, yeah. iconic aircraft to uh, to see in the foreground there with the red well, arrows we, we, coming we, over yeah well we appreciate all the work planes tv does you know we see you guys around a lot of the air show and we like the, the products a lot so yeah thank you very you much well. Thank you very much. And yes, good luck to you and the, the collection in this strange time. I know it's going to be a, yeah. uh, a long haul for all of us, but hopefully we'll come out. Uh, uh, we'll su we will survive it. We're confident of that. And my thanks again to, for, to Peter for joining us and indeed Ben earlier on. We'll have a little bit more of Ben in a moment. Um, I thought I'd just draw your attention to that Facebook page because I was serious about... Um, let's get uh, that right set up again. This is uh, the British Airliner Collection over on Facebook and oh bless them shared this stream and this live nose droop honestly it's really good entertaining stuff it would have been fun to be there see a bunch of scouts enjoying it but a really interesting talk um, alongside the the nose drooping and you know coming down for taxiing back up as the as they're airborne and then up into the sort of super supersonic stages of the flight I found it very engaging, really interesting stuff. And as Peter said, they're looking to put together a uh, shorter edit of that with some onboard views of the Concorde. Speaking of which, so that's on their Facebook page. Please do go and follow. Only 3,000 followers there, which is wonderful, but they deserve some more. Uh, this is the app that Peter was talking about, or, or I was. So we're stuck at home. We'd like to go and look at some aeroplanes, wouldn't we? Uh, so this is a uh, opportunity to go browsing around the, the flight deck of the Concorde and indeed the rest of the aircraft. Um, this is a, a 99p app on both, uh, it's available on Android and also iPhone. And uh, yeah, it's a really interesting way of uh, perhaps getting a tour of an airliner since we're not going to in, any, in the near future. Um, do go and check that out. So I was talking about uh, Ben, uh, helping me out by joining me yesterday. Uh, let's go back to my conversation with him and we were reflecting on some of the highlights of the Duxford May 2017 show. So moving on to 2017 then and I move away from the idea of uh, theming each show to the Duxford Air Festival. Yes, this is intended to be a, a good family event with a really wide array of aircraft perhaps fewer of the Duxford-based historic aeroplanes, but still with them taking a major role in uh, proceedings, but bringing in some very interesting historic and modern aircraft from all over Europe. And it coincided also with a new team coming in to organize and run the flying displays at uh, Duxford. So- Another rarity. Jan Frey, flying display director. We have Jeff Brindle and Rod Dean taking the role of flying display coordinator. And as you've seen, a sneak peek there of the, the Norseman, an aircraft that we don't see, uh, I, I've never seen, and I'm afraid know very little about. Well, a fascinating aircraft, the Nordown Norseman, best known because of the association with Glenn Miller. And this was how we sort of themed commentating um, over the display with uh, appropriate soundtrack included, mm -hmm. because it was in one of these aircraft that the famous wartime band leader went missing on a flight from Twinwood Farm in the UK to Paris, where he was due to give a concert. And of course, his uh, precise fate, what happened to um, uh, him, the rest of the crew, and to the Norseman on which he was flying, still the cause to this day of uh, much investigation and speculation. The Norseman, as the UC-64, as it was designated, was one of the main utility transport aircraft of the US Army Air Forces during World War II. And therefore, they would have quite often have visited Duxford. I think the 78th Fighter Group stationed at Duxford may even have had one as a hack aircraft. Oh, wow. But this was certainly the first time since World War II a Norseman had ever been back to Duxford. And it was the only display I know by one in the UK. Owned by the Norwegian Aviation Museum, but operated by the Norwegian Spitfire Foundation, who also operate the Sharkmouth Mustang as it was, so that's now just been put into new markings. And 
Sean Patrick's two-seat Sea Fury, and it was one of their pilots, Finn Terrier Shirud, who flew the aircraft here. The reason for it being with the Beaver, both of them Canadian designs, both used as bush planes in Canada, but really the Norsemen very much the focus for many of us on the airfield that weekend. Absolutely. A very powerful, very potent display aeroplane, extremely agile, and obviously here it was uh, performing a little more gently because of the need to um, uh, have the beaver kept in behind it, but it can, as a solo act, put on a very, very dynamic display indeed. Interesting. Martin Oval there in the aircraft restoration company Beaver. We've just got a few minutes of this display. I might, might let you enjoy the audio. I'm conscious that, you know, you're, you're very good on a show day, Ben, to allow the aircraft to speak for themselves as much as possible. And uh, I'm sure viewers at home would enjoy some of the sounds of these radials. So let, let's take a look at the remainder of that display. The first Norseman, engine on the first Norseman was soon replaced by the 450 horsepower Pratt & Whitney Wasp. Just 17 had been delivered by the outbreak of war, but then the Royal Canadian Air Force started using them, followed by the US Army Air Force. This one served with the Royal Norwegian Air Force. Also, it was operated by civilian companies in Norway and Sweden. In 2015, it came back to Norway in the ownership of the Norwegian Aviation Museum in Buda, but it's operated now by the Norwegian Spitfire Foundation in those original colors. The Beaver, meanwhile, following it in that display, we've somewhat ignored due to the rarity, rarity of the Norseman this one's a beautiful example from the aircraft restoration company. This type, 70 years old this year, used by plenty of Canadian civil operators, also the US military and the British Army Air Corps as a surveillance platform, largely in Northern Ireland, but also a host of other roles. This one, an ex-Army Air Corps example, but it's been civilianized by the aircraft restoration company. It flew again as such in 2011. So continuing with 2017 then, and an aircraft that I, I don't, I think this is probably the only time I've seen it flying at Duxford, and probably, possibly the last. It's sadly not an aircraft we're likely to see anytime soon again, the Sea Vixen. Yes, indeed. Um, it was uh, at this stage owned by uh, Naval Aviation Limited, the uh, operating arm of the Fly Navy Heritage Trust, and based at um, Yeovilton very much as their flagship one of the most spectacular historic jet display aircraft we've ever seen, certainly on the civilian uh, display circuit, um, and certainly in the UK. Um, but alas, this was to be its last show for some time because it uh, operated out of Yeovilton for its um, display, a stunning show in the hands of Simon Hargreaves against beautiful blue skies, went home to Yeovilton, unfortunately suffered a technical problem on the way back and was, to cut a long story short, forced to make a belly landing, which Simon did, given all his vast experience as a test pilot and uh, operational pilot, of course, of uh, sea harriers and the like, very, very skillfully keeping damage to a minimum, but it's damage that's kept the aircraft out of the air ever since. And uh, they're still assessing the feasibility of a return to flight while carrying out some repair work so never say never no it might well turn if funds are forthcoming but this the last chance to uh, see it for a little while and didn't we enjoy it in at relatively slow speed here an aircraft that made its post restoration debut in civilian hands here at Duxford in May 2001 it hasn't been back since here it is now the de Havilland Sea Vixen FAW2 standing for fighter all weather. That was the task for which this aeroplane was conceived, the de Havilland DH-110, making its maiden flight on the 26th of February 
oh sorry, September 1951. RAF and Royal Navy requirements for a new all-weather fighter coalesced in the late 1940s. De Havilland came up with this aircraft to meet both. The RAF opted for the Gloucester Javelin, which of course served here at RAF Duxford. The Royal Navy initially wanted an upgraded Sea Venom, but de Havilland carried on developing the DH-110. And the Navy resumed its interest. The first operational squadron was 892 Squadron from July 1959. And the Mark II that we see here was a considerable improvement on that. Inter on that integration of the Red Top missile afforded more flexibility in making missile attacks when compared to the fire streak that the aircraft had previously carried. The Sea Vixen in its day in the Cold War period was a good bomber destroyer, but arguably still a bit outmoded compared to other fighters of the era. And the bomb aiming equipment arguably not ideal for its secondary ground attack role either. A few years ago I spoke to Jonathan Whaley about this. Jonathan, you may remember, used to fly that fabulously coloured Hawker Hunter misdemeanour at Duxford and many other venues along with other aircraft. He flew Sea Vixens operationally with the fleet air arm. He said the primary role would have been to attack incoming bombers day or night in any weather. From that point of view, it wasn't a bad aircraft. Given a good weapon system, it would have been up to the job. But if Jonathan said the bombers were coming in cloud, a red top missile wouldn't have picked them up. We needed a radar guided or a better heat seeking weapon, which we didn't have. Nonetheless, it was a fabulous aeroplane. One very unusual and to some degree unpopular for those who were seated in this position aspect of the design, the two crew layout with the observer sitting in what was known as the coal hole beneath the pilot in the right hand side of the nose. Sea Vixens were involved in many carrier borne operations with the Royal Navy. They never went properly to war but amongst other things, they patrolled around Iraq and Kuwait in 1961 after Iraq, not for the last time, had threatened Kuwait, flying off HMS Victorious. They made air-to-ground strikes, providing support to British forces against rebels in the Radfan area of Yemen. Now here, we see the Sea Vixen with wheels and I expect a rest to hook down for a 360-degree orbit at crowd center. Vixens were on high alert aboard HMS Victorious during the confrontation between Indonesia and Malaysia and at least once one of these aircraft intercepted a Tupolev Tu-16 Badger bomber of the Indonesian Air Force. But the end was soon nigh. 899 Naval Air Squadron in whose markings this aircraft appears conducted the last Sea Vixen cruise aboard HMS Eagle in 1971-72 around Australia and the Far East during which time it covered the withdrawal of British forces from Persian Gulf bases. It wasn't just the Sea Vixen era that was ending in that period. 899 Squadron, the last to disband on the Sea Vixen in 1972, and this one, the last airworthy survivor, carries proudly the winged fist emblem of 899 on its tail fins. It was built in 1963 by de Havilland's factory at Harden, in Chester. It was one of just 29 new build Mark II Sea Vixens. The others were all converted Mark Ones. It only served with 899 variously at Yeovilton and embarked aboard HMS Eagle. It later was converted into a pilotless target drone. Those pilots.
pilotless operations never materialised, so it was stationed for many years at RAE Clanbeda with the Royal Aircraft Establishment, supporting trials of the Jindivik pilotless drone and as high-speed targets. That was until 1991 when it was bought by de Havilland Aviation and restored to fly on the civil register. Since 2014, it's been in the hands of Naval Aviation Limited, the operating arm of the Fly Navy Heritage Trust, the organisation that preserves the heritage of British naval aircraft in airworthy condition. It acts as an aerial ambassador for the Trust, which now operates under the Navy Wings brand, with both the Sea Vixen and the Sea Fury T-20 as its own aircraft. It supports those, including the Swordfish of the Royal Navy Historic Flight. It has other aircraft under its wing. <laughs> and roaring past us there, under the power of the two Rolls-Royce Avon Mark 208 turbojet engines, the flagship very much, the Sea Vixen. What a gorgeous aeroplane and such a shame we don't see it anymore. After that flying display, as Ben was saying in the introduction, carried out a wheels up landing at Yeovilton and the Navy Wings are, they are, you know, looking for funds. And it, as I said on my um, Yeovilton broadcast last weekend, if you, you know, if you have a spare penny, um, the, uh, these guys deserve some support. All that stands between us and a flying CVX and is an awful lot of money. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to um, support them, their website is navywings.org.uk and you'll see on there, um, yeah, lots of news about the aircraft and uh, the other activities of Navy Wings. So yeah, give that a look. Um, thanks to all those supporting us. Forgive me for interrupting the flying action again. I just want to say a thank you to Joseph, uh, who's made, made a big order of DVDs just. Um, if you are watching, thank you very much, Joseph. Every little helps. And it probably justifies my getting up this morning to come in and um, and carry out and produce this broadcast. Um, th thanks to everyone else, of course, for your uh, stars over on Facebook. And um, what have we got on YouTube? Poor, bless her, Chris has left us a £5 uh, super chat over there as well. Thank you ever so much. Every little helps. And speaking about justifying getting up in the morning, um, this morning, I, th this artwork behind me, um, I'm looking for more uh, for my next broadcast. So if you fancy a picture, and I don't mind if it's a child's drawing, would be wonderful. I love the idea of children watching these streams and getting a kick out of all the, the flying aircraft that we're obviously not, not getting to see at the moment. I know my two are at home watching and enjoying, and uh, these are drawings by them that they've provided for a backdrop, and I'd love some more artwork. So if you want to submit something, uh, do find me or Planes TV on Twitter and send me a picture of your, your best airplane drawing or photo or whatever you like. I'd love to include it in a future stream. Um, this one was done this morning, and uh, if you want to know what my morning prior to this stream looked like, Let's have a little look. Morning. So yeah, I kicked my morning off in the traditional pre-air show fashion with a bacon sandwich and uh, yeah, playing around with the sat nav there, navigating to Duxford. Wouldn't it be nice to be there? But here we are. I'm sat in my office in uh, deepest, darkest Devon and uh, and you are where you are. And uh, like last week, I'd love to know where you are. I know we've got someone in from New England. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you're from further afield, do let us know in the chat. Let's get back with some flying, shall we? We're going back to 2017 and uh, a highlight of that show, and I believe the year after as well. Uh, I'll let uh, Ben and myself introduce it.
the aircraft that followed the Sea Vixen then was the Rafale. Um, and this is the part where I make my usual excuses about just how hard an aircraft the Rafale is to, to film uh, particularly well. Um, what you're about to view is a, is a live mix of the flying display. And the, the, it's a combination of the fact that it's a relatively small aircraft, extremely manoeuvrable. Um, yeah. And there's just something about the speed and the, the rate of turn uh, and the sheer flamboyance of the French Rafale flying display that make it a challenge for, to, for us to record. But a, a real spectacle yeah. at Duxford. Yeah, this was the first time we'd ever seen the Rafale at uh, Duxford and it returned the following year. Duxford has often had very good participation from the uh, French Air Force with the Patouille de France and others. This was the first opportunity we had to see the Rafale there as part of the 2017 Duxford Air Festival and it did not disappoint. Without any question, one of the best fast jet displays to be seen anywhere in the world. You mentioned, Ian, the rate of turn. That's the th one of the things that most strikes me about any French Air Force Rafale display is not just the rate of turn, but also just how much the display pilots are able to pack into 10 minutes. There is always something going on, often highlighting the aircraft's ability to transition very, very rapidly indeed from yeah. slow speed into much higher speed flight and vice versa. The changes of pace in a Rafale display are something to behold. And as you say, there's something about it that um, gives it an extra little bit of flamboyance compared with virtually any other conventional fast jet as opposed to thrust vectoring aircraft like the f-22 that we see on the display circuit quite right it's it's a very hard thing to describe and it's uh, so i can only describe my emotions whilst i'm filming it so i remember the following year in 2018 i recorded the aircraft on my own middle of the airfield uh well not the middle of the airfield somewhere sensible uh but just the 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 energy that it took to record yes. that flying display that's and and the yeah. relief when it had finished you know that's that's uh, my uh my only way of uh, giving you some of the uh, the emotion of what it's like to witness the the rafale performing live so let's take a look at its full flying display then last nearly 10 minutes I hope you enjoy this in its entirety and uh, you'll enjoy the first bit Ben because it looks like it kept took us all by surprise as multi-role combat aircraft of the current generation here comes the Dassault Rafale C <laughs> the aircraft in the hands today of Captain Jean-Guillaume Martinez an instructor on Escadron de Transformation Rafale 34 Aquitaine, based at Saint Dizier in eastern France. That's the French Air Force's Rafale conversion unit. where there's something going on all the time constant changes of direction 
between aerobatic manoeuvres all under the power of the twin Stekma M88 afterburning turbofan engines. Transitioning from an inverted pass to a negative G push. Coming in, I think, for one and a half rolls, followed by a half Cuban eight. There's the one and a half rolls. Pulling up into the half Cuban. All the while showing off this very attractive special colour scheme for the 2017 display season. And out of this, Marty will be pulling into a manoeuvre called the Square Dance. Transcribing a square in the sky, rolling at each corner. slows and I expect to see the gear coming down here as indeed it does as Marty brings the Rafale C in for a touch and go. This an aircraft produced to meet the requirements of both the French Navy, the Armée de l'Air and the French Air Force, oh, sorry uh, the French Air Force, the uh, Armée de l'Air and the Navy, the Aeronautique Navale. <laughs> Navy, the Aeronautique Navale, first to take the type into operational service, followed by the Air Force, the Armée de l'Air, and Rafales have seen much combat action in all the theatres in which French forces have been engaged since the mid-2000s. As now we see the Rafale at the slow, pulling into a low-speed loop. Marty now repositioning for a very fast pass, demonstrating a tactic used regularly in operational theatres such as Afghanistan to disperse crowds, for example, a show of force.
There was a very interesting opportunity of late for the French Rafale pilots to engage in exercising with other examples of the current generation of multi-role fighters. exercise Atlantic Trident at Langley Air Force Base, Virginia, where they exercise with RAF Typhoons and US Air Force F-35s and F-22s. What the French refer to as an omni-role fighter, air-to-air, air-to-ground, reconnaissance, all within its sphere of capabilities, and quite brilliantly shown off today by Capitaine Jean-Guillaume Marti Martinez from the 3-4 Aquitaine Squadron of the French Air Force at Saint-Dizier, the Dassault Rafale C. Superb stuff, and I don't know if you could hear just the applause coming in there. Um, a well-received display, and I can uh, I can tell by some of the camera work there that we were, almost, like I say to Ben, quite relieved that, that it had finished. It's uh, an intense flying display, and it's going down really well in the chat on YouTube. Everyone's saying, oh, some people comparing it to Typhoon unfa un unfairly, maybe? I don't, I don't know. We'll see a Typhoon display in just a moment. I thought it would be an interesting uh, comparison to make. Um, but let's get back to Ben. That was his last display that we'd selected and uh, we just said our, our goodbyes. But don't go anywhere. As I say, we're about to have a Typhoon display, which you can compare to that Rafale one. Uh, ben, thank you very much for, for joining me and uh, reliving some of the highlights of the May Air Show. It's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun uh, reliving them with you. It's been a lot of fun for me as well, uh, Ian. <laughs> thank you for giving me the opportunity. And of course, we wouldn't be able to do any of this without the quality of flying displays that IWM Ducks has given us over the years, whether they be the sort of themed spectaculars that we saw some of in this package or some of the great solo acts like the Sea Vixen and Raphael at the at the end. An absolute joy and long may it continue. Absolutely. Let's hope we're uh, back in action in 2021. Yes. Yeah. Or indeed in September 2020. That is quite right. As we were talking to, to Peter Archer, Duck, Duxford Aviation Society, we are all, of course, hoping. I mean, at the time of uh, talking to you now, we're, we're late May. I'm certainly hoping that we're all going to be back at Duxford witnessing these air, air displays in person again. And aren't we just? We can cross our fingers. So let's go into uh, that Typhoon display then. Uh, it's selected from the... Hmm, let's get this right. So this is back to 2016 actually. So someone in the chat can fill in who the uh, pilot was in that year. Let's take a look at the... What have we got there taxiing out? We'll, we'll find out. I'll allow you to enjoy it. We're clear it with the weather gods, and we've finally got some nice clear skies and some sunshine for you. As mentioned, I'm Corporal Rob Stark from the display team at RAF Coningsby. Going to be bringing to you quite an exciting display this afternoon. The uh, 2016 display is flown by Flight Lieutenant Mark Long of 29 Squadron RAF Coningsby. And if you look to your right, the camera's at the ready just be able to pick him out as he makes his run in to break crowd centre and begin the display. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2016 RAF Typhoon.
for flying the Typhoon. Mark was the qualified flying instructor on the Hawk and later went on to fly the Harrier GR7 and GR9. Each of the EJ200 engines produces 20,000 pounds of thrust each, which is obviously just slightly more powerful than your standard hatchback car. Camera's at the ready as he comes in for his high speed low pass. Having that much power in the aircraft allows Mark to push it up to positive 9G and as low as minus 3. Other than bringing this display to you today, this jet's normal duties are providing 24-7 cover for the British airspace.
blended stuff and I hope that was fresh enough in your mind especially Michael for you to make a comparison between the Rafale and the Typhoon display there uh, a hard one to judge I know certainly from my experience of filming it that uh, that Rafale is certainly as as Ben was describing the changes of uh, vector velocity ve velocity vector or um, speed and uh, yeah just the sheer ch turning of agility make it a very difficult aeroplane to film mind you so's the hawk you know so what that's a judge of i'm uh, i'm not sure but uh, certainly in my experience i really uh, find the rafale a challenge uh, but an enjoyable one because of that and uh, of course we see typhoon a lot more often so uh, yeah enjoy the rafale for me uh, let's take a look then. So we've gone through, we started the day off right back in 1995 uh, and went through the, the 2011 through 12, 13 through to, that was from 2016, but we have done 2017 already. And uh, we're just going to dip into just a few minutes of the May show in 2018. This is a segment from our British Air Shows program from that year, um, introduced by me, maybe a little bit of an abrupt start. Um, but just gives you a flavour of the, the show in 2018. We didn't put on a full live broadcast of the Duxford Festival of Flight in May, but we did pop by to run the DVD stall and it was a huge pleasure to meet some of the fans of our coverage. Not something I often get the chance to do. Of course, the fantastic lineup couldn't keep me away from the camera all day. We'll show a brief look at some of the rarer appearances, starting with the return of P-47 Thunderbolt, G-Thun. Yeah, fantastic to see the Petrie de France. We, we uh, they've been a fairly regular performer at uh, the May Air Show. Um, certainly the Duxford shows. Uh, I'm trying to think now, and they're obviously based out of Cambridge down the road. And I don't know whether it's still the case, but it used to be that if you uh, had a look at Cambridge uh, Airport over on Google Maps, that they're all lined up there with the Rafale. Um, and now I'm just waiting for 20 seconds because I've just thought of a very important display that we saw at Duxford May Show in 2019. And this was uh, Barda's Bus Company and formed in sort of uh, collaboration with uh, the aviation charity Aerability, uh, a charity that I'm currently working with to produce something of interest to you, hopefully, in June. And uh, one of these live, live streams um, 
bringing together some really interesting people in the airshow community and lots of interesting display material. Um, let's take a look at Barda's bus company then flying at uh, Duxford May 2019. A new and very welcome addition to the display circuit is Barda's bus company. They are the first ever disabled formation team to be granted display authorization by the CAA and this is their display debut. We didn't, looks like we didn't have the PA feed uh, in Duxford this year, but really nice form, formation display and it's be interesting to see where that uh, takes us in the future. Um, I know there are aspirations for, uh, yeah, for, for other things, shall we say, it uh, will be very, follow that with, uh, with great interest. And um, as I said throughout the stream, we're, we're going to finish on the red arrows in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I'd uh, just want to remind you that uh, the new content over at watch.planestv.com is British Air Shows 2011. I'm actually about to show the outro. Uh, to that program. Okay, it gives you a sense of what's of the contents of it. There's a nice piece of music there But it was also um, a poignant year. We lost two red arrows that year and uh, with recent tragedy in, the, in Canada I thought it would be just a moment to reflect on uh, yes, yeah, some of the um, You know how uh, I'm struggling for words here because I didn't want to um, go into too much detail on it, but you know people have lost their lives for the for the air shows that we enjoy and a, a chance now to reflect on that. As always in Britain, there was a wonderful variety of air shows in 2011. There's something for everyone who loves aeroplanes, and even for some who don't. The year was, of course, marred by the death, not just of John Egging at Bournemouth, but also of a second Red Arrow, Flight Lieutenant Sean Cunningham. He died in an extraordinary ejector seat accident at the team's home station, RAF Scampton, during training for the 2012 season. Because, of course, the shows must go on, and that would have been the clear wish of John Egging and Sean Cunningham.
Yes, I hope you enjoyed that little look at the uh, the action from British Air Shows 2011. And as I say, a, a moment to have that little reflection. So this is our air show. We can choose what we ha how we end it and how better to end a, uh, a flying display than the red arrows. So I've selected the display from, oh my goodness, let's get this right. This is 2016, I believe. Yes, the American uh, air show themed. Um, all of these programs, or the vast majority of them, certainly the refined edits, are available on watch.plainstv.com. That's our PTV on demand system. And as I've said throughout, the, there is the DVD and Blu ray sale over on uh, plainstv.com. If you fancy supporting what we do here and want a bargain, they're all 30% off uh, this weekend only. Um, and yes, uh, thank you to those. I spotted a really nice comment over on the chat on YouTube saying you, you've signed up for the. Um, I think it was the chat from Devon, and I've forgotten your name, forgive me, uh, but he signed up to watch.planestv.com to support us in what we're doing here on YouTube and on Facebook. So thank you. That's the spirit, in the spirit, certainly the spirit of what we're trying to achieve here, and I'm really grateful to those that have been signing up on watch.planestv.com. Anyway, let's finish this uh, show on a high, shall we? So in lieu of being at Duxford uh, this weekend uh, for real, let's go back there to 2016, and this Red Arrows display. Let's have a big cheer for the Red Arrows! I'll just turn Mike down a little bit, shall I? <laughs> Apologies if that blew anyone's speakers. Voice there of Red One, squad leader David Montenegro, as he enters a right hand turn with the team, calls them into shuttle. Red One is in his second year as the team's leader. He's a former Hawk instructor, Tornado F3 air defense pilot, and then joined the Red Arrows initially in 2009, flying till 2011 and ending up leading the synchro pair. That's him at the front of this new shape. As the smoke goes off, they form the shape of the space shuttle, coming in from the right to fly the shuttle roll. Going upside down at two and a half thousand feet, 400 miles an hour, with the jets now around six to eight feet apart. At the front of the right hand wing of that shuttle is the first of our two new pilots this year. That is Red 2, Flight Lieutenant Matt Masters. Matt started his career as an instructor on the Tucano aircraft before moving to fly the Tornado F3. And then he's most recently come from another Hawk unit, the Royal Air Force's Aggressor Squadron, number 100 squadron, before joining the Red Arrows this year. Front left, we're forming a new shape. This one's called Apollo, and it was given its name back in the 60s when the NASA Apollo program was in full swing and it's reminiscent of the lunar landing craft from the Apollo missions. We put this in the display this year to celebrate the achievements of a fantastic inspirational individual, Major Tim Peake, who's currently sat on board the International Space Station. So ladies and gentlemen, celebrating Major Tim's experiences and Britain's re-ignition in the space program, this is Apollo. Here, there, Reds 2 and 3 acknowledge the move to Typhoon, and they do so with a very set cadence in their voices. The idea is all the other pilots continue counting on that set cadence, and on the count of four in their heads, they extend their air brakes. On the count of six, they retract them, and that gives them uh, the right cadence to move back as a formation at the same time to form another shape, which is Typhoon. Bit of colour now in for the left, Typhoon. This is Typhoon. <laughs> well, the other of our new pilots has just come from flying the Royal Air Force's Typhoon multi-role combat aircraft. He is on the front left wing of that Typhoon shape, and he is Flight Lieutenant Cy Taylor. He's Red 3 this year. 
He started off his career flying the Tornado GR4 and moved across to the Typhoon flying with number three squadron and then as an instructor on 29 squadron, the operational conversion unit. And a big hello to Michelle, Sai's wife, who's here watching the display. She's a student at Cambridge University. Hello, Michelle. Looking right, you'll see another shape being formed. This is for a brand new manoeuvre this year, which celebrates the Royal Air Force's fast jet workhorse, the Tornado GR4. The Tornado Bomber Force has been on near enough continuous operations for the last 25 years, starting with Operation Granby at the start of the first Gulf War, and it has been near enough on redness around the world ever since. So in from the right, on comes the smoke for Reds 1 to 5. 8, 9, round, 7. 8 and 9 start rolling in Tornado. Well, six of the nine display pilots you're watching have in fact been Tornado GR4 bomber pilots. One of which is Red 5, who's on the far left of the seven arrow at the front of that Tornado manoeuvre. He's Flight Lieutenant Emmett Cox. Emmett's in his second year with the team. He's actually from New Zealand and he moved to the UK in 2002 to join the Royal Air Force. Starting off flying the Tornado, then moving on to be an instructor on the Tucano aircraft, teaching basic fast jet training. Front left now, you'll see the wings on each side move back to the very back of the formation, a beam Red 7's jet. Now, bearing in mind, the new pilots normally have a very stable platform, a beam Red 1. They're now 120 feet away from Red 1's aircraft. Now, all of the pilots in the formation don't look at the jet only six feet away. They all have specific references on Red 1's aeroplane. So this shape is very difficult. They're about to come left. Now. And present Swan. Hold in that back. Now, tight. Hey. Reversing right now. You can hear that Red One also has a set metronomic cadence in his voice. The idea being is it enables the pilots on the very extremities of the shapes to anticipate their control inputs to keep the formation moving as one unit. So he has a very set cadence so the pilots can put in their inputs before he puts his in and it keeps our shape moving as one. To the front right, the smoke comes on to set a new shape and at the top of that moving formation is Red 9. He's Flight Lieutenant Joe Hurston. And Joe's in his third and final year as a Red Arrows pilot, starting off as a Hawk instructor in his career, moving on to the Tornado and then back to the Hawk, but this time the Royal Air Force's newest advanced trainer, the Hawk T Mark II. That's him on the top of this shape, which is Big Vixen, which is named after the 1960s naval fighter, the de Havilland Sea Vixen, as they get ready to fly the Big Vixen roll. Easing up. Upside down again. Let's give the pilots a big wave while they go upside down at two and a half thousand feet. On the far right, as we look at it, is uh, Red 8, who's also in his third and final year in the team. He's Flight Lieutenant Stu Campbell. Stu started off instructing on the Tucano and in fact displayed the Tucano in 2008. He then moved on to fly the Tornado GR4 with number 617, which everyone would know as the Dam Buster Squadron before joining the Red Arrows. So it sounds as though we haven't uh, been given the airspace we were hoping for, so we're going to form a shape called Dagger to the front left. And at the front of Dagger are Reds 1 to 5. They're known as Enid after Enid Blyton's famous five. And in a straight line at the back are red six, seven, eight, and nine. And their formation name is Jippo, which was given to them back in 1968. It was the nickname of the leader of the first back four when the Red Arrows started officially flying nine ship displays back in the late 60s. So Enid at the front and Jippo at the back. Now, so far we've had all nine jets together performing close formation aerobatics, but now we're going to split down into sections of two to seven aircraft and show you some much more energetic flying. So out to the front. We've got the formation running towards us. Get your cameras ready for the detonator. Right. 
So Enid at the top, they fan out to their angles. Keep your eyes on Jippo with the coloured smoke underneath. The synchro pair will remain with us performing derry turns. On the left is red six and on the right red seven. They're currently flying at around 1,200 feet, pulling on the light buffet max performance back towards the airfield. They're about to descend to just 100 feet above the runway as they close towards each other at around 750 miles an hour for their opposition manoeuvre to start the synchro pair. Cameras ready for the opposition barrel roll. <laughs> Pilots now call turn, they're good full power, turning away from us, pulling 6G. So the pilots working hard, their hearts have dropped around three centimetres in their bodies, the blood wants to pool in their feet, their G suits have inflated, they're really straining against this 6G force as they point back towards us to fly the cyclone. Pitching up front left with a bit of white smoke on is Red Six, who's the leader of the Synchro pair. He's Flight Lieutenant Steve Morris, and he is in his fourth year as a Red Aries pilot, having flown as Red Seven last year. Steve started off his career as an instructor on the Hawk, moved on then to fly the Harrier GR9, and when that was sadly disbanded, he moved on to fly the Tornado GR4. So that's Red Six descending at the top. Red Seven, full power, pulling 6G, cutting inside the circle, getting into line astern. Look, right 45, you'll see reds 1 to 5, 8 to 9, dropping down to form an inverted V-shape for the goose. And a very patriotic moment now, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, let's have a huge patriotic round of applause, Duxford. Enid 8 and 9 climb over to our left hand side with a brilliant red, white and blue stripe. Bring your eyes down to the right. So looking right now to find the synchro pair and the return of what I think is a fantastic synchro pair manoeuvre. On comes their smoke. Keep your eyes to the right for the shotgun. Shotgun there, Red 6 and 7 rolling upside down on the right way up at different times. You can hear Red 6 is having a lot of fun up there. Keep your eyes down to the left now to find Enid, who've been joined by Red 8. Red 8 flying behind Red 1 with his white smoke. So cameras out to the left hand side. They're about to roll out. Rolling out. Rolling out along the line. The white smoke's going to come on. Ready for the revolution. Rolling now. Two, three, and eight roll. One, rolling now. Two, rolling now. Each of the pilots there performing an aileron roll manoeuvre, essentially just a full left hand control column input to roll the aircraft rapidly around its longitudinal axis. Looking straight ahead now to find red six, seven, and nine. Red 7 and 9 with their coloured smoke begin to roll around Red 6 with his white smoke. Before they split, cameras ready for the vortex. <laughs> 
Once again, the synchro pair perform their derry turns in this derry pattern, pitching up to 20 degrees nose up. And they're getting ready to fly the double rolls. Well, normally we call this manoeuvre the double rolls, but this year we have changed the name in honour of an aviation legend. Captain Eric Winkle Brown sadly passed away this year in February, and he was a Royal Naval fighter pilot and test pilot with a world record of flying the most number of aircraft, 487 aircraft. Normally the double rolls. This year, ladies and gentlemen, these are the Winkle rolls. Winkle as he was a short chap and that was his nickname during the war. Looking right, 45 degrees now to find Enid. Reds 1, 2, 3 and 5 form a box shape. The fifth jet's now rolling around them a dozen times. Coming right now. This is the twister. Hold in the bank. Now tight. This year's twister pilot with the red smoke is Red 4, Flight Lieutenant Mike Bowden. Mike's in his second year with the team. He's a former Hawk instructor, Harry, a GR9 pilot, and then moved on to fly the Tornado GR4. And that's him finishing off with his red smoke, getting very dizzy on the left-hand side. Now, bring your eyes further left towards the big hangar to find the four aircraft of Jippo. Camera's ready for this manoeuvre. On comes the white smoke. Red six and seven roll upside down. Now, no trickery here. Eight and nine are directly matched underneath in mirror. Red eight directly behind underneath, sorry, red six there, working very hard. He can only see around a foot or 18 inches of red six's jet. He's got his head cranked right back in the cockpit to maintain formation. Now look to your left-hand side. You'll find the five headlights of Enid. The inside pilots pitch up to roll to the outside in the rollbacks. Difficult manoeuvre to get those rolls exactly matched on the left and right hand side. Enid doing a great job there this afternoon. Looking right further still, you'll find the four aircraft of Jippo. Enid, smoke off. Go, Jippo, smoke on. Go. On comes the smoke to the right hand side. Six, rolling. Eight. Once again, red six and seven upside down. Eight and nine. Roll, go. This is the corkscrew. The corkscrew finishing off to the left. Now look to your front right 45. Front right 45 to find Enid. Enid, line astern. Red one calling them into line astern. You'll see them drop down top to bottom, stacked one to five as the smoke comes on. He's about to call coming right, and you'll see the jets swing out like a pendulum. The pilot's using lots of rudder there in line astern to keep that straight line as possible. Now moving into reverse battle. Normally, Red Arrow's formations have the odd numbers on the left, the even numbers on the right, but we've changed it in this shape. Reds 2 and 4 are at the top on the left. Reds 3 and 5 are at the bottom on the right in reverse battle. But we're going to swap back to our normal sides in a rather artistic fashion. This is the slalom.
back in their normal positions, uh, much more comfortable on the side they're used to in battle. The Jets are around 20 feet apart with some red, white and blue as Enid finish the slalom. Looking straight ahead now to find Jippo. They're pointing directly towards the airfield. On comes their smoke. Eight and nine pitch up to roll around six and seven. They then complete their own rolls to split in the Jippo break. His white, red smoke changing white on the right hand side is Red 7, who's synchro number two, Flight Lieutenant Tom Boll. Tom is a second year pilot with the team. He started off as an instructor on the Tucano, display pilot in 2010, then moved on to fly the Typhoon. And Tom's watched here today by his parents, David and Jackie. So a big hello to you. Tom on the right, followed by Red 8. And on the left, Red 6 with the smoke on, chased down by Red 9. The four aircraft point towards each other. Their closing speed is now 810 miles an hour. Cameras ready for the amazing Jippo Pass. Oh, oh. Uh. Looking to the front right now, you'll see Enid pitching up in a shape called Leader's Benefit. Yeah. Red, white and blue smoke comes on. They're going to draw a snake-like shape of smoke in the sky now as they fly a manoeuvre we call the Python. Hold in the bank now. The bank. So two to five, turn their smoke white. Red one uses red and blue as they finish these Python rolls, which gives me a good time to say hello to my family. I've got Anne, Nick, Nat, Nicola, Ella, Jojo, and Isla and Debs here. So big hello to my family coming to watch today in the sunshine. That's the Python finishing over on our front left-hand side. Now we need to look left and right again for the synchro pair. This time, red six from the right and red seven from the left. On comes their white smoke. Their closing speed is 800 miles an hour. They're going to cross three times in opposing 360 degree 6G turns as they fly the carousel. So on your left with the red smoke pulling 6G is red 6 Steve and on the right with the blue smoke red 7 Tom. They swap their smoke colours at the apex of this manoeuvre and as they pass around the front, back to white smoke. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the synchro pair. Now, looking straight ahead, you'll see red nine. Red nine is joining the rest of the formation with reds one to five and eight and up comes red nine. The smoke comes on. They roll out towards us, ready for the display's finale. They are in a seven-ship Vixen formation, and they are about to fly the Vixen break. Camera's ready. You've been watching the Royal Air Force aerobatic team, the Red Arrows. Hopefully a fitting way there to end our look back to some of the very best highlights that we've recorded at the Duxford May air shows over the years. Um, if you've enjoyed what you've been watching, do leave us a comment. Um, sorry, give, like the broadcast. So give us a like over on uh, Facebook if you're watching there or a thumbs up on YouTube. This helps other people find us. If you've uh, enjoyed what you've seen, it helps uh, YouTube and Facebook know that we're worth watching. So uh, And do, of course, share the stream to uh, whoever you think might be interested. We talked earlier about the uh, British Airliner collection at Duxford and how you can uh, 
remotely, enjoy a little browse of the Concord via their app. Uh, you'll find detail of that on the Duxford Aviation Society website. The URL I've forgotten, but Peter was kind enough to mention it earlier. Um, I'm going to stick around for a little while in the chat on uh, Facebook and YouTube. If you've got any suggestions of shows that you'd like to see in the future, in the near future, um, do feel free to let me know in there or any questions about Planes TV, our archive or um, yeah, products you'd like to see uh, broadcast here on a Saturday at 11 a.m. I am going to continue to do these Saturday every every Saturday at 11 a.m. And if you'd like to see something specific, just let me know in the uh, in the chat either on Facebook or YouTube. As I say, I'm going to stick around. Any questions? Do feel free to ask. Well, I'm just going to leave the um, the video running here. It's quite nice to see the end of uh, a show day at Duxford. Everyone heading home. Wouldn't it be nice to be there for real, but we hopefully we'll get a chance to be back at Duxford back in September later in the year. So yeah, thanks for sticking with us all day. If you were here at the beginning, you'll know I'm uh, running on backup systems, so hopefully they've all held up uh, as a sufficiently well enough to have you, for you to have enjoyed the stream. Uh, it's made things a little more challenging for me, but uh, we like to be kept on our toes. Obviously having a hardware failure a couple of hours before going live. Bit, uh, bit challenging, but the backups kicked in and we're a bit okay. So who have we got? Oh, and I did want to say a big thank you to all those leaving stars on uh, Facebook. Um, so Adam Rowe, thank you very much. Anthony, Shirley, Kevin, Nicholas, Darren, James, Sarah and Sandra. Thank you all very much for leaving uh, us some stars over there. Uh, a new thing for us. I'm really not sure uh, what I think of it yet, but um, I'm very grateful for you making those contributions to justify us producing these streams it's really helpful uh, of course and all those placing orders for dvds and blu-rays over on planestv.com there's a 30 percent sale on all duxford products uh, i'm going to run it until monday evening so uh, you've a bit of time but uh, hey go and have a browse now planestv.com see uh, if there's anything that takes your fancy and of course there is a free trial available to watch.planestv.com, our PTV on demand service, where you can see many of the programs that we've been watching through today and hundreds of others uh, from air shows over the years. It's an on demand service, you can watch it all as and when you like at watch.planestv.com. Give it a spin, seven day, seven day free trial available. As I say, I am going to stick around, so I don't feel like you have to, but if you want to join me in the chat, I'm here. Great end to a brilliant day, says Callum. Quite right, I enjoy. Stephen says, thanks again. Enjoyed seeing the Civix and Me Too, a brutish aeroplane. I was reflecting as I was watching it. Uh, it's about the weirdest place I've ever done an interview. Stood on the wing of, uh, of the Civix and an incredible aeroplane. Like, the lumps and bumps on that aeroplane. How, why it made good sense, I, uh, I don't know. That sort of layout of aircraft. Um, yeah, a real chunk of uh, metal to see being thrown around the sky. Any displays from the early 90s? I'm with you on that, Gunnar, and I'm... Yeah, I'm toying with the idea more along the lines of this... Um, you know, picking bits and pieces from our sort of 60, 90 minute programmes. I find quite enjoyable and, uh, you know, it means each flying display is just a few minutes long. That's all you can fit on a 60 or 90 minute programme. But I think makes for... Uh, sort of more more rapid live broadcast um whereas hitting play on a, a recording of a live mix is um enjoyable um it's quite nice just picking those short elements out from lots of different programs so yeah early 90s i'm with you we'll see what we can do brian says milden hall and yeah, of course it would have been milden hall would it be this weekend i'm too young to remember exactly when but it was a bank holiday weekend it used to be so perhaps it should have been Milden all week in this, this year. So maybe I'll... It won't be next week that I run through some of our Milden Hall shows, but I will do it. Um, we've got some great stuff through the 90s. I'm just looking at F891. There's on my uh, watch.planestv.com website at the moment. Uh, yeah, we'll pick some highlights at some point. Someone else says Tor Torbay. Joshua, yes, we... Do have one year of Torbay. It's probably sat on a YouTube channel somewhere, so 
you go dig that one out. But uh, what I might do next week actually is Western uh, Seaside Show. Um, I'm probably not going to be here in person, although I will introduce it and I'll be in the chat as much as I possibly can be. Um, I feel like a seaside air show feels appropriate. Um, if there's sort of um, down here, it's the end of the uh, half term period. I can imagine us all at, uh, on the beach watching some flying displays. I think it might be quite a fun one to have on next Saturday. As I say, I'm doing these Saturday 11 a.m. each week. Anyone left on Facebook to say my goodbyes, really? I'd love to see a DVD about the Sea Vixen. Notice they have one about we have one about the lightning. We do indeed have one about the lightning. That's going back into the very dim and distant past. Well, the lightning is. I'm also thinking about doing streams based around a specific aircraft. Um, that idea is in its infancy, but I I can, can I can see if a, a uh, format where we perhaps we are able to get out and about and do some recording this year, where we do. Um, streams based around a particular aircraft include, I won't say too much, but uh, include some material from the present day if you like, either an aircraft being restored or perhaps even flying. Um, yeah, and, and Lightning's one I quite like the idea of. And Sarah's saying she'd like to see a DVD on the Sea Vixen. Not beyond the realms of possibility, it's certainly been discussed. And um, depending on how the rest of the year goes, it may be that we'll be looking to that sort of product at the end of the year. Corsair before they went, yeah, before we lost them all. Paul, Paul says on Facebook, Corsair. That'd be a nice subject, wouldn't it? Couldn't comment before now, as I hardly turn to Facebook. Thanks for the memory, says Sylvia. Thank you, Sylvia. Nice to see you on there. And thanks for the comment. Yeah, everyone's really enjoying these. I'm I'm so glad to see that there's a good been a good audience for these, um, and that it's provided a bit of distraction perhaps from uh, what's going on in the world. I know it's uh, providing, giving me a good purpose each Saturday to come in here and uh, and uh, produce these streams. I'm enjoying them a lot, and I'm excited about what we've got planned through the summer um, season. Or would have been streams to coincide with some of the events that we'd normally be working with be more information about that in due course who else has got questions yeah mozzie and b17 yeah a themed and b17 would be fun wouldn't it get up to duxford for a hunt round sally b perhaps we'd like to see red arrows in formation with the f117 at react Oof. i can't recall what that yeah that was either but a nice idea Looks like everything's uh, finishing up on Facebook and on YouTube. So I'll say it again. Thank you ever so much for uh, joining me. I've had a lot of fun. And thanks again to Peter and Ben for joining me uh, yesterday to record those pieces. Looking back at some of our shared highlights of uh, flying displays from Duxford May Air Shows over the years. Um, we'll be live again next Saturday, 11am, as we will for, for the foreseeable for as long as I could manage it, basically. Um, do give this uh, broadcast a like, share it to anyone that you think might enjoy it, and of course sign up for the email newsletter. It's the very best way to keep in touch with us and uh, what we're doing and any uh, yeah future broadcasts. Thanks again, everyone. I'll uh, see you again in the very near future.